Welcome everyone. Some access notes before we begin. This is a webinar, so your attendee videos and audio aren't on. Um, however, we do want to have this be a community space. We wanna hear from you. Um, we've turned off chat to be more accessible, but we encourage you to use the Q&A space as if it's a chat space. Share your affirmations, your questions, and your thoughts there. If you need tech support, you can ask your questions there as well, and either myself or my colleague Shana will assist you. If the Q&A box is unavailable to you, you can also send in a question to pklinst at sfsu.edu, and we'll pass it on to our moderators or speakers. So I'm Emily Badix, the Interim Director of the Longmore Institute on Disability. I'm joining from San Francisco State University on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples, the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. I'm a white woman with no disabilities at present today and curly brown hair. I'd like to begin with some gratitudes. Thank you to our Emerge Fellows who were all willing to go on this journey as the first cohort and have taught me new things every single day. Thank you to Alex Locust, our Emerge Project Director, who has showed up with integrity, strategy, and heart every day since he started. To Shana Guraya, our Access Coordinator, who helped coordinate the logistics for today. And our Longmore Student Fellows for all their help supporting every step of the Emerge process. Lastly, I must express my gratitude to the Mellon Foundation for their support providing the funds for this opportunity. I'd like to share a bit about how this project came to be. The Mellon invited the Longmore Institute to propose a concept for how they might initiate new support in disability studies. The project that came to mind has historical roots. In 2000, Paul Longmore received support from the NEH that's the National Endowment for the Humanities, to convene a group of scholars at SFSU for lively, intense, sustained conversations in disability studies. Lifelong friendships, professional collaborations emerged, which rippled to have a greater influence on the field of disability studies. So I proposed a similar opportunity, but with a hybrid model and shifting to recognize that disability scholar activism includes a lot of impactful work about disability that is happening outside of academia due to the lack of opportunities for disabled people in higher ed. Just pause and catch up. Um, but the basic goal was the same, to help establish a new cohort and network of those whose projects and perspectives will influence the future of both disability studies and disability organizing. We received 310 applications and assembled a jury to make the very hard choices of selecting the final fellows, 11 for this cohort. I'd like to read each of their bios now, as a few won't be participating today, but we still want you to have the opportunity to know about them, learn about ways to engage with their work. I'll be sharing slides with headshots and we'll describe the alt text of the fellows who are not present today. I'll leave the visual description to the speakers presenting today for themselves to give you more updated. The first slide has Ebony Oldham, an organizer and cultural curator based in LA whose work weaves black feminist theory, critiques of quote, health humanism, end quote, theories of anti-blackness, anti-fatness, technologies of gender, crip of color critique, and fat studies to examine the black fat, the fat black. Ebony and Maya's collaboration will be a multimodal digital zine staging moods, attitudes, textures, and postures of two black disabled fats in a world structured by the intricacies of anti-blackness, anti-fatness, ableism, disposability, and the carceral state. Maya Charnel is an artist based in Los Angeles. They use black visual aesthetics and portraiture to critically explore blackness, disability, gender, sexuality, 
and fatness. Their most recent exhibit centered, str centered struggle and nuance of PTSD and acceptance as a black disabled, non-binary, queer and fat person. And again, Maya is in collaboration with Ebony. Next slide. Allison Masonke, um, who I'll read the alt text for, a Philippinex femme with long black hair, dark brown eyes, and light brown skin, sits in a chair with warm orange backdrop surrounded by several green plants. She's wearing an outfit of yellows, greens, lavender, and light wash blue, denim blue. They look directly at the camera with a serious expression and their hands resting on their knees. This photo was taken by Bianca Requenco. Um, Allison is a Philippine X entity, entity, disabled, queer, femme, trans cultural worker, scholar, and more. Their work highlights their experiences as an Aswang, shape shifting entity in Philippine folklore through lenses of Philippine folklore, spirituality, and magic, while engaging critical theories which unsettle colonial constructs such as technology, race, humanity animality and monstrosity monstrosity her project is an article theorizing aswang embodiment and how it dis disrupts white european constructs of gender disability and humanity while implicated in colonialism anti-blackness and racialization t s banks is a black and qt disabled non-binary teaching artist poet and playwright from Madison, Wisconsin. He is the founder of Loud and Unchained Theater Co. and LNU Publishing House. His work addresses visioning for Black liberation, a critique of the medical system, radical care and access, madness, QT mad crip liberation, disability justice and abolition. T's project is an anthology of Black mad C slash K crip poets, artists, and playwrights from the Midwest which culminates into a short transcribed video showing the process and clips of interviews with anthology participants. Bowen Cho, Bowen is a person of Korean heritage, has short black hair, which is faded at the sides. They are standing on a summit in Petra, Jordan with rocky hills and a bright blue sky in the background. Bowen is a neurodivergent queer and disabled scholar activist. They are the co-founder of Neurodivergent U a web-based project that ranks U.S. colleges based on how well they meet the needs of disabled and neurodivergent students. The novel rating system comprises metrics overlooked by established rating systems like U.S. News, which center the safety of white non-disabled students at the expense of racially marginalized and disabled students. The website also features student stories told through the medium of comics and manga that antagonize the tendency in ableist academic spaces to invisibilize, sanitize, and disappear disability. Z. Zemaika is a Jamaican-born, queer, disabled, multidisciplinary writer and nonprofit worker who advocates across abolition gender, racial, and disability justice movements for the rights of persons who engage in sex work. Their project uses micro essays to reclaim theories around various forms of justice to build solidarity within the communities that birth these theories. Their project consists of four micro essays written in poetic prose that highlight the emotional aspects of struggle with which we call, can, all can empathize. Isabella Vargas is a multimedia artist and disability activist working at the intersection of media and activism. She combines captured footage and drawn animations to rewrite narratives about her intersectional communities. Vargas investigates the marginalization of people and relationships with disability, ethnicity, queerness, and intergenerational trauma. Isabella's video project, quote, we are ghosts, end quote, is an anthology and media archive of the stories of those in the immigrant diaspora caught in between identities while navigating race, diaspora, and its relationship to disability. Natasha Thomas, P 
PhD, MTBC, is a queer black disabled child of immigrants from the island of St. Vincent. Natasha teaches music therapy at IUPUI in Indianapolis, Indiana, is a black music therapy network steering committee member and co-hosts the Black Creative Healing Project. She works with those who are ready to transform. Natasha's project is creating and curating a Black Creative Healing Album, a multimodal accessible research archive of African diasporic approaches and perspectives on healing as a construct. Mix Lou Weaver is a six, sick neuroquim, near, neuroqueer femme, apologies, transgressive care laborer, settler, and co-conspirator living in Victoria, BC. She is passionate about sex worker liberation and disability justice movement organizing that centers relationality, sustainability, and amplifies the wisdom and healing of those living in the context of pandemic times. Lou's project uplifts relationship building by bringing disabled sex workers into a dialogue together once weekly throughout the month to build safety and connection and identify the scholar activism folks may already be involved in within their communities. Uh, her photo shows a smiling white person with a black bob and bangs and red lipstick. She wears a black blouse and is against a gray background. Rise is a queer, black, disabled, gender fluid femboy who has resided in Patawatomi, Ojibwa, and o Ottawa territories, Chicago, for the last 16 years. Rise is a visual artist, poet, full spectrum birth worker, yoga teacher, meditation facilitator, gender affirming and trauma informed care and disability justice educator, access consultant, and community care worker. RISE's project will build and carry out a two-part program called Disability Justice Grounded Birthwork that will disrupt the erasure of disabled folks in reproductive justice and center them in a Buy Us For Us campaign. RISE is a brown-skinned Black femme, smiles forward from the chest up. They have on a Black shirt and yellow and blue spiral earrings. They are in front of a cyan blue wall and a green monstera leaf-shaped pillow. Their hair is up in red and blue box braids in two buns at the top. Okay, a tie. Tai Lu is a transdisciplinary artist, writer, and community organizer centered on chronic illnesses, social, cultural, and physical effects. Tai works at the intersections of Western biopolitics, Southeast Asian diaspora, post-war intergenerational suffering, relational ecologies of interdependence, and the concept of metamorphosis. Ty's project continues on existing project of documenting their life with chronic illnesses, serving as a starting point for discourse. Their auto-ethnographic exhibition demands visibility for the invisibilized suffering of disabled people, a widespread phenomenon of which non-disabled people might have limited awareness. So participating in this program for the first year has been a really Really rough experience for these fellows in many ways. They've had to do a lot of labor that they did not sign up for to educate this university and also myself about the ways that harm and systemic oppression happen in higher ed, even at San Francisco State, even at the Longmore Institute. This month has been a challenge. It's been a joy. It's been a hell of a learning experience. And we will be documenting what we've learned with feedback from the fellows so that others may learn from this experience and the mistakes that the Longmore Institute has made, as well as the wins here. Already, access changes are being made on our campus thanks to Emerge Fellows Advocacy. We are grateful to end this month sharing this journey with you, celebrating some of the projects the Emerge Fellows have been working on, and the community of collective access that they have built through their shared learning and collaboration, and taking in their thoughts on scholar activism, organizing in hybrid ways, and some of their experiences being in this fellowship. So thank you for joining us. We are so grateful to Imani Barbarin for being our keynote speaker for this symposium today. When we were trying to think of someone who could usher us into a day of disability scholar activism, a leader who has opened up opportunities and spaces for our fellows through their work 
and can demonstrate the impact that these fellows will have, Imani Barberin was the first name that came to mind and we were floored that she said yes. Imani is a disability rights and inclusion activist and speaker using her voice and social media platforms to create conversations engaging the disability community. Born with cerebral palsy, Imani writes using her platform to speak from the perspective of a disabled black woman. Imani is from the Philadelphia area and holds a master's in global communications from the American University of Paris. Published works include those in Forbes, Rewire, Healthline, Bitch Media, and more. Imani has created over a dozen trending hashtags that allow disabled folk to have their perspectives heard while forcing the world to take notice. Hashtag patients are not faking. Hashtag disabled people know. Hashtag abled's are weird. And other hashtags provide a window into disabled life while forming and galvanizing the community. Imani runs the blog crutchesandspice.com and a podcast of the same name. So I would now like to pass it over to Imani and thank you so much for being here with us. Hello, thank you so much, uh, Emily. I really appreciate the glowing introduction and thank you all for asking me to be here. When I was asked to, let me first start with an image description. My name is Imani Barbarin. I am a black disabled woman, fat black femme. I have a bright red dreadlocked bob and I'm wearing, I, I don't know what print this is, it's animal like, but it's a uh, leopard, I guess, gray print top and I'm in front of a green themed uh, virtual background. Um, again, thank you all for asking me to be here. It's very rare that I get the opportunity to talk to fellow disability advocates that are also along this journey um, with me. And in terms of talking about and speaking to disabled people, it is a, in a lovely change of pace. And I always leap, up, leap at the opportunity to speak to the next generation or the generation coming up now who are, in, who are engaged in this work. Um, and it's very uplifting to see some of the projects you all are working on and the avenues of advocacy that I might not have thought of myself. And so I thank you so much for the vulnerability of using your own experiences to further advocate for the disability community um, and multiple, multiple communities within the disability community. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about what it takes to advocate and quite often when we talk about our work, when we talk about academics and when we talk about um, the road that lies ahead for us, we rarely if ever focus on what that task requires. When we talk about advocacy, we're not talking about the emotional toll, the emotional labor um, of ourselves, of having to exist in disabled bodies every single day and then simultaneously justify why they should exist to everyone else. That in and itself is very difficult. And I heard what Emily said in regards to difficulties happening with the Longmore Institute and everything happening. And of course, it's gonna be difficult to constantly be on, constantly be performing, constantly be advocating. I guess what I wanna to do today is talk to you in such a way that I wish somebody had spoken to me when I started this work. There are a lot of moments of lessons and education that can be derived in every interaction that we have with our community. But really, I wanna to talk to you as people, as disabled people. When I first started this work, I was in very much a, a place where I felt like I didn't know who I was and that I had spent so much of my time as a child growing up in almost all white spaces and going to all black churches on the weekends and still quite often being the only disabled person in the room. I felt completely alone. And while in the back of my mind, I knew I wasn't, there were other disabled kids that I knew, there were other disabled girls. It was a very isolating experience uh, in pursuit of presenting me with some of the best opportunities 
to succeed as a black woman oftentimes my parents forgot to talk about disability and what culturally that meant for me of course I experienced it every single day and my parents made sure that I knew how to advocate for myself but rarely did we engage in conversations about what community could mean for me and what using community and engaging in community could do for me. I started finding other disabled people in college um, after kind of falling off of the cliff's edge in, in my first year and nearly failing out and feeling like I had worked so hard for nothing and that regardless of what I achieved academically in high school, in middle school, regardless of all those good grades that I was not as academically rigorous or as smart as people had thought me to be, but rather people decided to pass me along because I was disabled and they felt bad for me. And I was at a loss. I had no idea where exactly I was supposed to be and who I was supposed to be. But then I started reading and the discourse around disability um, listening to Stella Young and reading Audre Lorde and really thinking hard on these experiences and reading on the page and watching as things arose before me that were experiences that I was having in real time, that I was experiencing when I left that classroom or when I put down that book. It was so important for me to be able to see on a page, see spoken out into the real world that, that what I was experiencing really did in fact exist. And I'm not losing it. I'm not less valuable. I am not, um, I'm not these lies that I've been taught to think about myself. And I just want to speak to the power of every single one of you for just existing. Even if ac academic activism and scholarly activism didn't exist, you existing is enough. And I always caution advocates and I always caution activists and people who engage in this work to remember you, to remember you at the end of the day, to remember, yes, community matters. Yes, all of these things matter, but to remember to not give so much of yourself that nothing is left. Share those moments of joy with the people around you. Share those moments of revelation. Utilize the advocacy itself to build, to have fun, to, to create joy, because that matters too. We often get so caught up in talking about what is so difficult while living with a disability and what is systemically facing us and the barriers that we face. And those are that is important. I promise you that that is important. But what is just as important is not forgetting the person next to you and the person in your own seat remembering that in a world that will look at us and judge us and pretend that we don't exist, that simply acknowledging that you exist and that the person next to you exists is enough. That making sure that people's experiences are heard and felt is enough. I often, I to this day, I get caught up in asking myself if I'm doing the right things constantly, if I'm saying the right things, if I am being the right person in every single moment. And it's also important to know that we, that when we talk about community, when we talk about disability, that it's okay not to know everything. That's why all of you are focused on something different. It's okay to learn from one another. It's okay to utilize resources and give people resources. Advocacy, disability advocacy especially, is a collaborative process. Accessibility is a collaborative process. And I want everybody in this room or in this digital room to remember that it is important to come together. It is important to collaborate. It is important to share knowledge and share this basis of understanding because that is how we have traditionally moved forward as a community as disabled people. It wasn't just that I was reading the experiences of other disabled people that helped me along, that gave me grounding, that gave me foundation in the work that I did to do today. It is that I could learn from them. 
It is that I could derive knowledge. It is that I could exist and feel validated in what I was seeing around me. And that is important. We share these moments for a purpose. We share this idea of who we are and we pour from ourselves so readily because we know just how much it matters. Excuse me. But I wanna make sure you all remember you. I want you to remember who you are. One of the things about advocacy that is incredibly, um, somewhat disheartening is that I see so many advocates. I see so many disabled people. I see so many people fighting every single day. And these are people who have expertise and have joys and passions and goals. And I'll tell you this story. When I was, um, when I was graduating grad school, I applied for hundreds of jobs and I felt I wasn't being chosen. Nobody would pick my application. Nobody would email me back for an interview. Nobody would do anything. I worked hard to make sure that everybody could see that I was doing advocacy work, that what I said mattered, that I could change things. And nobody would pick my application. And I kept disclosing that I had a disability and I never got an interview once I, when I disclosed. When I stopped disclosing I had a disability, I would get dozens of job interviews and opportunities, but still I walk into every room as a fat black <laughs> disabled person. And so I took to the internet as one millennial does. I took to the internet and it talked about just how difficult it was to find a job and just how difficult it is to exist as a disabled adult and that nobody actually tells you what it's like. Nobody shares this knowledge. And disabled people just came out of the woodwork to say, this is not a unique experience. This is what I've gone through. And they shared and were vulnerable with me and shared with everyone exactly what it's like to exist in bodies that are not deemed valuable in a society where our bodies are the value. And I, it felt amazing to have that conversation. And they taught, and in that moment, they taught me about the advocacy that they've done at work. They talked about how often they fight just to be seen, how often they fight just to be validated in their expertise. And I find this trend that disabled people are often thrust into advocacy work. And we spend so much of our time advocating and fighting and pushing and debating that we often forget why we wanted that space in those rooms to begin with. It's the journey, we, we, we're so, we're so long on the journey, we forget what to do once we get to the destination. And I want you to never forget why you do this work. I want you to never ever forget why this matters because, it's okay to realize that the space that you're creating isn't just for everybody else. It's the space that you wanted to exist when you were denied it, when you first started your advocacy. It was the space that you really wanted to be a part of, and that's okay to acknowledge. It's okay to, to advocate and want the space you create. And I just want you to not forget that this advocacy can lead to great change. And it's okay to want that change for yourself too, to want minds and ideas and perceptions and narratives around who you are to change in your lifetime. It's not unheard of to desire those things, but never forget that your advocacy is going to matter to everyone, and but it has to matter to you too. In talking about some of your projects, I see avenues of advocacy, like I said before, that I would not have thought of, that I would not have been able to engage with early on in my advocacy career. Not because I didn't want to, 
simply because it was unknown. It is those avenues and those those paths less traveled that are so important to disability advocacy, uplifting sex workers, uplifting queer disabled people, uplifting um, the voices of marginalized and um, bodies that have been colonized by history and time. It's important to understand the intersections of disability and that when we talk about disability, when we talk about ableism, that ableism is the toolkit, but white supremacy is the goal. Marginalization wears itself on our bodies every single day. And it's important that as you go down this road of advocacy, that you take time to reflect and to build in time for self-care. And I will be the first person to tell you 100% of the time, I am not good at that. Because existing in the same type of body, existing in a disabled body, while simultaneously advocating for why disability should matter to so many people is a draining idea. And that's what I wanna hammer home today. I'm not saying don't do the work. I am not saying quit. I'm not saying any of those things. I am saying, remember you because you will get lost in this work. It will become all consuming and it will become difficult the longer and longer you do it. And that's okay. But if you want to do this forever, if you want to, if this is your, if this is your reason for being like it is mine, you're going to have to take rest, take a break and lean on the disability community. You're going to have to lean on the people whose understandings you've, you've yet to hear. You're going to have to lean on people whose, um, who, for whom you have preconceived notions of who they are. And you're gonna have to unlearn as you're learning, as you're teaching, as you're growing. Lastly, I wanna talk about some tips for advocacy because I think it is incredibly important that we acknowledge that in the space of advocacy, particularly when it comes to those who are known for their advocacy, that we have a very narrow view of who gets to advocate. When we talk about advocacy, when we talk about disability, we know that historically it has been seen as mainly a white issue. Disability has been mainly perceived as a mainly white issue. And seeing all of these faces, black faces, indigenous faces, queer faces, um, in the introductions that I saw today, I'm greatly encouraged that we are moving in the right direction and putting microphones to the voices um, that society is dead set on not hearing. When you become an advocate, it's important to remember to never assume somebody's capacity. And that includes us within the disability community too. A lot of times people with, who are perceived as um, reasonable or as see, seen stereotypically as more intelligent or have less support needs are the ones that are given the mic most. The ones that are, um, that non-disabled people trust the most to talk about disability experiences. But be open to understanding that there's a ton of disabled people who are often not represented as advocates um, in our society, even within the disability community, even though they are, even though that is what they do all, all the time. Um, when we talk about communities and intellectual and developmental disabilities, it's important to get on the ground and talk with um, grassroots organizers with those disabilities and um, lending credence to their own experiences as well. And not making assumptions based off of what we're told some disabilities look like or how they interact with others. We don't know. <laughs> That's why accessibility is a collaborative process because if we want that understanding, if we wanna build society for our community, we have to build it for all of our community. Additionally, um, making sure that you are being open with your learning process. Learn out loud. That's, <laughs> learn out loud, take accountability out loud. Make sure that you feel that you are constantly looking towards the community for the signals about what needs to happen next and what people want, what people want to, to uh, for our community, what they what, for themselves. What are the greater trends in advocacy that can be integrated into your own work, 
and what needs to be acknowledged and collaborated with in order to move the needle forward on disability advocacy. Next, um, <clears throat> make sure that you are building space for yourself. Make sure you are building that rest out for yourself. Make sure <laughs> that you have the time for relaxation and restoration. Make sure you're building with other people and building joy with other people. A lot of times advocacy is uh, replaces our joy, but advocacy can be our joy and we can create joy as advocacy. Have fun. I am never more re re uh, refreshed or replenished than I am with other disabled people. I am never more happy and laughing than I am with other disabled people, particularly those who understand the difficulties of this work. Lastly, well, another last thing, um, don't be so wedded to academic language that you miss communicating with other people. This is just from my expertise as somebody who studies communication and understands communication. A lot of times when we talk about advocacy and academic advocacy, we get caught up in talking in the ways in which the dominant culture wants us to speak. And we get caught up in saying exactly the right things, exactly with the exact correct lexicon and word choice. And we forget that some people, for some people, the people who, um, from whom we derive these lessons and utilize this data, the people who give us their stories, a lot of times they do not understand it. A lot of times when we're spreading messages about disability and when we're talking about disability, we forget that we're talking to regular people a lot of the time. Academic language is important for academic spaces, but if you want to communicate to a larger audience about disability advocacy, about the work you are doing, create work that it can be understandable by as many people as possible. And don't be so proud that you don't break down things into smaller concepts when people don't understand. And it can be difficult. It can be very difficult, particularly in online spaces when you don't know if people are um, sea lining or concern trolling or um, information trolling or trying to waste your time but there are people who genuinely don't understand and want to. And if we are meant to come together and collaborate and understand the disability community and understand society at large and how disability plays a role and fits into multiple different communities, we're gonna have to meet people where they are. And we're gonna have to be able to speak to people as we are. A lot of times I can online and, uh, uh, people from multiple different cultures, black people, um, uh, queer people, regardless of their background, they say, oh, I, I wanna say this, but I don't speak as quote unquote eloquently as you do, or I don't speak as well as you do. I always poo poo that idea. We need you. We need your voice as it is. The way you explain something is the way that somebody will perfectly hear something talk in AAVE about larger concepts around advocacy, that matters. Talk in your native tongue, talk in your native language about disability advocacy, because that matters. Talk in the way in which you talk in the world, because you're talking to regular people whose lives are impacted by disability and they may not even realize that that's what's happening. Talk to people um, like you would talk to a friend because it matters. Advocacy is such an incredibly important part of our existence as disabled people. And I really hope that this cohort becomes the advocates they always picture themselves being and that they reach the goals and ex eventually um, get to experience some of the fruits of their labor. But this is a long, hard process. Advocacy is continual. It is never ending. Once we reach a goal, there will be another goal. Once we reach a plateau, there is something else to be done. 
but I don't want you to forget you in this moment because you, while you are advocates, you're my people. Yeah, you're people that I want to see fed. You're people that I want to see have fun. You're people that I want to see um, have experienced joy. And I want you, as you engage in this advocacy journey, to find the balance for yourself, to find the boundaries that you need to put into place to protect yourself, protect your work, and protect the longevity of this existence as an advocate. I don't, I hope that in the work that I've done, that in the conversations I have um, facilitated, that I have made this work a little bit easier for you. I know that I'm not perfect, and I hope that people understand that I do not, uh, I try not to hold myself to any super high idea of myself. I'm, I try not to um, do that because I hope that I impress upon to you that I learn from you as much as you learn from me. I listen to you all. And that our community is multifaceted and our experiences need to be too. The ways in which we interact with each other needs to be too. And the way that we pause for happiness for ourselves matters too. And while I'm not good at that, like I said before, I really hope that in the work that I've done, you have the permission to do that for yourself. That you make space for yourself. That you not forget who you are in the midst of all this. When I was <laughs> when I was given the opportunity to talk to fellow advocates, I get excited because what I want for you all is an easier life, an easier time in advocacy. And for my labor to have made that a little bit easier for you. And so I thank you for asking me to be here to talk to you all and to kind of usher you on this next phase of the advocacy you've probably been doing for most of your life. That's why I didn't want to talk to you a little bit <laughs> too much about intersectionality or because you already know these things. You're living these things. You exist in these things. What needs to be said aloud is where you fit into all of it and where our community fits into all of it and how we can be collaborative partners in the road ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Imani. I know the adjustment to virtual means not hearing the immediate room full of applause, but I'm so confident it is there and I'm just so grateful. Um, so with that, we're gonna put up a slide sh to let everyone know the schedule and share the schedule today. And then we'll have a brief break before our first panel begins. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Happy Symposium. My name is Alex Locust. I use he, she, and they pronouns interchangeably. I have the pleasure and privilege of moderating the next two panels. So I'm going to offer an image description or an audio description of myself. I'll offer a um, brief explanation of this next panel, and then I will turn it over to our presenters. Um, I am a white and black biracial queer amputee. I am tan, got a black curly shag with some pearls, a colorful blazer, and I'm uh, zooming to you from uh, what I lovingly refer to as my, my pink paradise. I'm in a very pink room right now. Um, I have had the opportunity um, to be the program director of the fellowship, of the Emerge Fellowship this summer, and I'm thrilled to introduce these next um, presenters. We have a few fellows who have chosen to um, share what they've created and invested in so far in this fellowship time together. And so we're going to give each of them 15 minutes to present individually, that'll go in sequence. And then at the end of that, we'll have 30 minutes available for audience question Q and A for, um, for those presenters and I'll, I'll moderate that. So as they present, 
as they perform. Um, we welcome you to use the Q&A function to um, offer affirmation, invite reflection, um, load up your questions, and then when we get to the q and I'll help relay that to the performers. Um, I will let the performers introduce themselves, um, but up first, I'm going to invite Natasha Thomas to join us. Hello, everyone. I'm honored to be kicking us off. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then offer a visual description of myself. All right. My name is Natasha Thomas and I am a uh, black queer person femme presenting with a black a uh, head wrap that has a mud cloth print on it. I'm also wearing a gray tank top with a soft silky green um, tunic sort of overlay, uh, black lined glasses and earrings that are um, printed similarly to my head wrap carved out of bone. I'm a deep honey colored chocolate brown skin, I think is the, the language I'll use today. And uh, I'm zooming in from Miami land, also known as Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm sharing today on the topic of Black Creative Healing, an arts-based research album. That is the title of my project and Black Creative Healing is a passion project that I've had for a long time now and I'm excited to be moving into this new um, way of exploring the concept of healing, Blackness and creativity. So about us, um, because Black Creative Healing is not just me, um, I'll start by telling you a little more about me, but um, Black Creative Healing involves several people. It's a collective of um, Black folks from across the African diaspora, um, across aspects of disability, across um, queerness and all genders, and um, working towards healing ourselves and our community collaboratively as possible. Um, my own experience, I often refer to myself as a child of shipwreck and volcano. I am uh, descended from the Temne people of Sierra Leone and the Fulani of Guinea-Bissau um, who were abducted from their ancestral lands and brought to the crucible of the Caribbean where um, my parents immigrated from the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines which is home to the Kalinago people and the Garifuna. Um, the shipwreck is part of the origin story origin in all quotes, because we know that there were people on the island um, before um, any Dutch, Dutch folks arrived, but a Dutch slave ship crashed on the island and the, the legend is that the um, indigenous peoples came down, liberated the enslaved folks and um, killed everybody else and merged together, formed alliances and then fled back into the hills and took care of each other. Um, and there is something in that that has always resonated really deeply with me. Um, not so much the, the murder part, but the part about taking care of each other, fleeing into the hills. Um, I feel like a lot of the healing work that I do in the creative arts is just that kind of work. Um, if we have to flee into the hills, finding and creating and curating spaces for us to do that, um, to take care of each other. There is an active volcano on the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and I consider myself a descendant of that as well, as we are connected to the lands that we come from. Um, and I think there is, there's always been a bit of fire inside of me and inside of my lineage, um, and so I honor that as well. Um, uh, I mentioned that I work collaboratively in the Black Creative Healing Project. I do have a co-curator, Adenike Webb, um, who didn't join me for this particular arm of the project because we're both sort of taking some time to explore um, in the various directions that our own personal 
journeys in creativity are taking us. And you'll hear me talk about that sort of diverging and converging process um, as a part of art space research, that that's part of what we do and it's part of what deepens our experience um, as creatives and as collaborators. So in general, you can learn more about Black Creative Healing on our website, blackcreativehealing.com. We are also on Instagram, we're on the socials, um, but some of the work that we do that I'm most proud of is our community spaces. I mentioned this idea of us sort of fleeing into the hills and taking care of each other. Um, and what that has looked like really recently has been uh, a Discord space and regular community gatherings that happen. So Discord is a platform we've actually been using for this fellowship as well that's text-based where we can communicate with each other and there are channels for various topics for us to talk to each other. Um, but we also have a monthly social hour and a monthly creative co-work where we gather together to work on our own creative projects. Everyone sets an intention at the top of our time together, um, what we wanna be working on, where we'd like to be with it by the end of our time. We started with an hour, now they're like 90 minutes, sometimes a little bit more. Um, and then we each go and do our own thing, sometimes with music playing in the background in the collective Zoom room, sometimes just camera on being with each other while we work and then coming back and talking about our process, sharing what we've done and just encouraging each other in that way, in our own creative ways. Um, most recently, we also started adding these events that we call Care Craft, where we come together to work um, intentionally on something that is more specific. So each of us still doing our own thing, but honed in on a central theme. Um, and most recently that theme has been symbols, the idea of symbols, how they relate to our lives. We do some grounding experiences that I facilitate for us together um, to all be sort of sitting with the idea of how we relate to objects and visual imagery and symbolic sound and things that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives that we can be more intentional about making meaning from. Um, and that making meaning piece is where the idea for the album comes from. Um, because we live in a white supremacist structure. Um, we live in a world that still very actively wants to see all of us gone, um, not here, <laughs> not thriving, let alone being alive. Um, and so we want to be able to push back against that system, of course, that's part of the work, that's part of what Imani was sharing about earlier, but also we need spaces to heal from that. We need spaces to be able to make our lives um, have meaning and be able to amplify that meaning um, in spaces where we know we can be um, free essentially. And that's what Black Creative Healing looks to create. And so the album is emerging from that, to be able to do that in a really musical way, but also in a very inquisitive way, because the word healing has a lot of connotations. And so that's part of why we're conceptualizing this as an arts-based project, or as an arts-based research, a piece of arts-based research. So our process, I'm realizing I want to name some of the imagery that's on the screen here. In the last screen, I did have an image of a shipwreck and a volcano. Um, and on this screen, we have the word, our process, um, with some green leaves in the corner and a couple of um, asterisk sort of star-like symbols behind uh, various text. So I'm gonna start us with the text that's on the top left and then sort of move in a clockwise pattern around the screen. And the words in white are words that are typically used in arts-based research circles. Arts-based research is very academic. <laughs> it is very white. Um, that's changing a little bit, but it does use language that can sometimes come across as very clinical, even though it is a very creative thing. Arts-based research is about interrogating um, what we perceive as knowledge, honoring art as a way of knowing, and centralizing art to the process of inquiry. Um, so these, um, these words in white, we have converging and then moving around, defining, diverging, sitting with, feeling into. You get some of those more emotive words um, towards the end there, but these are all words that art space researchers will use to define some of what they're doing. Um, the words that are in sort of the soft seafoam green, which seems to be emerging as like a theme color for this project, um, are words that I'm bringing in 
as an African diasporic descendant. Um, because part of this work I'm learning is a going back and finding and retrieving languaging and practices that our ancestors have been utilizing for generations that were absolutely inquiry, <laughs> that were absolutely knowledge generation, um, but that may not have been thought of in these sort of clinical ways or not so much thought of, but honored. They haven't been honored in these clinical ways. And so I want to bring those back and I want to see them honored. And that's going to be the theme of the video that you're going to see shortly, the music video that I'll be sharing, which contains the first track of the album. So ritual is a word that I've brought in. Um, I've long told folks every time we have an event inside Black Creative Healing that something magical happens. <laughs> and I think that's because our gatherings are rituals, whether or not we set them up intentionally to be so, they have become so now. <laughs> um, and that converging of us coming together is part of the arts-based research process. It's part of this process. We come together, we talk. Um, we share ideas and things emerge from there. Then we move into this defining naming phase where we're giving breath to our ideas. We're letting things um, come to the forefront and sort of percolate. Um, and then we go into this diverging place um, where we go off on our own in a lot of the groups that we host and we ask questions and there's this inquiry that happens and that's very ancestrally informed as well. And then the sitting with and the feeling into, I'm relating to some of the historical ancestral practices of divination that our ancestors have engaged in, consulting nature, seeing what's in the stars, seeing what's on the ground, um, and letting that be part of the knowledge that we generate. So with these last few minutes here, I'm gonna move us to the next slide. It's gonna autoplay the video. I'll look at the chat and make sure that there aren't any like questions or issues with the tech. Hopefully there won't be, but I wanna shout out to my sister, Sasha Yearwood, who um, mixed and mastered this track. What you're going to hear is all my voice <laughs> and sounds that I gathered um, out in nature. And lyrics that are original from me as an invocation, an invitation to consider the ancestors in this work. Um, the video is audio described and captioned and the colors and imagery that you will see on the screen was created by me as well. So without further ado, I present to y'all, uh, Oh My Many Mothers. First, let me read this description on the screen. Sorry, I forgot about this intro. To be a Black creative healing is to draw a map between here and now, me and us, what is and what was, what we grieve and what could be, and all the many thens and thems, dreams and futures that thread between this body and the African continent. My map may not look exactly like yours but the nature of our journeys, our points of origin and guiding constellations are born of the same source. The ancestors light the way. The screen is filled with a shade of pale sea foam green and blue. Watercolor paint splatters onto the surface in a slightly darker shade, punctuating each footstep, while the deep exhales being heard are accompanied by long horizontal strokes of the same color from left to right each one placed slightly oh, above the other. My many Another horizontal brush stroke is made, this time in a shade of purple. Oh, my many the purple brush stroke bleeds into the original sea foam as more splotches of purple appear. Spirits. Colors continue their slow swirl into each other. I welcome your wisdom today. Oh, my many A streak of blue crosses the top of the screen. Oh, my many blue swirls into the sea foam. Oh, Spirit. 
colors continue to fade into each other. I will come your streaks continue today, my many mothers. Oh, the streak of yellow descends. My many and begins to circle the screen. The yellow spirals for its center. Your wisdom today, my many mothers. The yellow streaks more animatedly. Oh, my many fathers. Colors zigzags across the screen. of yellow continue to dominate. Oh, my many the screen is now almost entirely oh, yellow. My precious spirits, the color intensifies. Watches in a deep peachy pink. I welcome your wisdom today. The camera begins to zoom out. As it does, we see a more textured brush stroke in the original seafoam green color, swirling an S shaped spiraling pattern along the left center of the screen. The pattern is mirrored on the right side of the screen as we begin to see the full app being used to craft this painting. The swirling mirrored as shapes form a Sankofa heart. A color wheel appears and a deep is selected for the textured brush strokes, overlaying the original seafoam green to double on the shape of the Sankofa heart. The screen shifts abruptly to a final version of the painting cropped to a square shape overlaid with the words Black Creative Healing, the album. As the screen fades to black, we see the words coming, 2024. Thank you all for your time and attention, um, for sharing in this premiere um, with me. And I hope to see and hear more from y'all. I see some affirmations in the chat. I'll check out in a second as my as my fellow uh, my fellow fellows um, take the stage now. Um, and please, by all means, check us out at blackcreativehealing.com and on Instagram at blackcreativehealing. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for that, Natasha. I just want to echo seeing all of the affirmation in the chat. Please, uh, if you have questions that you'd like Natasha to respond to, um, use the Q&A function while we get ready for some more fabulous performances. Um, after that invocation, I know we're ready for more. So um, up next, <clears throat> I would like to introduce to the virtual stage, MZ Zemeika. Uh, I think it was supposed to be T. That sounds great. T, are you ready to go instead? Good. Yes.
Hello, everyone. Um, can I get a time check? Yes, T is currently 2.07 right now. So um, 15 minutes from here would be 2.22. OK, thank you. Yes. All right. Hi, you all. My name is T.S. Banks, and I am, and my pronouns are he, him, his, or Zizier. Um, please give me a second as I adjust myself. Thank you for your patience. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> Hi, my name is T.S. Banks. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am a black and fat and dark skinned disabled person with black framed shaded glasses, black locks with gold tips. And I am wearing um, a long sleeve knitted long john, dark gray colored, um, long sleeve shirt and I am currently sitting in my bed um in San Fran uh so I would also like to say that um I am the founder of Loud and Unchained Theater Co an all black QT mad crip arts and care collective we are based out of Madison Wisconsin um and today I will share my project with you called Wellness Check, Abolitionist Stories from Black, QT Mad, Sick, Ill, and Disabled Survivors. Um, this is a book and anthology series, um, a community of a community relevant definitions, interviews, poems, monologues, and video scripts of Black people who have identified as either mad, sick, chronically ill, current, and formerly incarcerated. This book lays out, um, Wellness Check will be laid out in like three different parts. Um, one, the first part is we need community care, not cops. Being sick is not a crime. Two, surviving the psych ward. And three, freedom dreams and access dreams. Um, thank you. While I adjust, I could not see the interpreter and am trying to check my speed. Thank you for waiting for me. Already, um, the earliest interviews in this series have been conducted by me since 2013, starting with the original recording and interviewing of myself with my camera phone and a camcorder from the 90s my father gave me when I went off to high school in, tw in 2002. Um, there are over 732 pages of transcription from personal and community interviews. And every participant in this project is black, queer, mad crip, and an abolitionist. Um, I want to say before I get into the pieces I'm sharing from this book um, that I will be going into a lot of definitions um, and spoken word um, poetry. Um, and I will start off with this definition first. Wellness check. The definition of psychiatric industrial complex is one, a term used to describe the way psychiatrists, psych institutions consistently send poor, disabled, and other Black people off to jails and prisons when they deny themselves dignified service and send first responders like cops to crises that insist on the incarceration of mentally ill people. Here is my plight. Plight is depression, 
is water laid in the hairs of my dermis, smooth in the palm, brittle and salty. My palm cradles a placebo already prescribed by my doctors who gave up on my recovery. Give me anything to silence discomfort, any outcome and they earn a dollar, yet I stay wet with grief. Depression is cloth like cuffs around my wrist when they label me psychotic and restraint is a cure when I try to pray for a God to savior of a pill to return me back home, stable and normal, able to be loved. I question God's love for me, how he made me sad and unimportant. Depression is so damn important. Physicians that try to violate everything that I once held secret, try to name me ill and incompetent, anything but a child of God. Depression is guilt. For missed birthdays and graduations, money wasted on tickets to concerts, still awaiting my applause and tears that my mother is tired of wiping. I'm tired of saying curses to every morning that I awaken, looking at shrinking pill bottles and wondering when I can exist without them. Depression is a weapon. And I have been assaulted. When the police show up for a wellness check, one, this time I called 911 on my friend when she was 19 and I was 22 and I wanted somebody to make sure that she was okay because the text said otherwise and the baby couldn't open the door. And when I got there, I panicked and, and this was so much on her, but I, could, I, I, I just couldn't open the window and I called them. And there arrived two cop cars, a fire truck, an ambulance, one white woman who was an officer and two other male pigs whom I could tell, yeah, they fed on this situation. The cops gave her no other choice but to leave her kids and go to the hospital or jail. And then it was me and two babies. And at that time, I had no other home of my own. And the calls from he her, because they were treating her badly and it was time she wanted to come home, but she needed somewhere safe and clear to clear her head and get some rest. Two, when they showed up for the second wellness check, I was in my I got ahead of myself. Um, this next part of my performance, um, I just would like to do an access check-in because I just remembered that I um, uh, shuffled past that. Um, and so I just would like to slow down real quick. Um, this next passages, I will talk about um, care. I mean, I will talk about harm. Um, that is done to my um, personal body um, and things that happen when I'm surviving the psych ward. Um, and I don't think that I put that care note in there. And so I just want to slow down. Thank you. Please take care of yourself how you need to. The second time that they showed up for a wellness check. I was in my new patient physical performed by my primary doctor, tearfully shaken by the pap smear in my gown came in an officer and two paramedics with a stretcher. And in the back of the ambulance I was in, they sent me off to UW hospital. 
in room 11. And I sat there still and naked with a gown and sticky from that pap jail with three doctors evaluating me. Six hours later, I am still there, naked and not allowed to call my partner, but I could call my mother on an emergency contact form whom I hadn't talked to in a while. See, the third time there was a wellness check. I showed up to my friend's door with some food, some squares, a blanket, and a charger. I talked with them for two hours and walked around the apartment complex, reflecting on what brought us there that night. She smoked the pack of cigarettes I gave her and ate all the gummy worms and McDonald's dollar menu that I could afford. We played the newest songs on my playlist and talked about how the doctors um, weren't listening. Eventually, I learned of everything that she took that night. And I didn't call the ambulance, ambulance this time. And eventually, we ended up at her apartment door and packed a bag and drove to the hospital and some blood was drawn. And she could hear my voice. And she could see me the whole time because there was no room without a security guard. There was no room with a security guard outside. There were no meds that were forced into her IV. And she was not coerced to receive medicine or inpatient services. And I wonder, I wonder what it would have been like I wonder what it would have been like if Tony Robinson had someone show up for him with some food and space to run the high down, sweating out his anxiety instead of seven shells erasing his chance to get well, hmm. the definition of wellness is an individual scale or feeling like yourself or feeling well whether that be physically, mentally, or spiritually. Sometimes when I feel sick, I disappear into a world and two, lose my grip three, binge four, insulin shots five times a day, five, the morbid obesity, six, the schizophrenia, seven, the mania, nine, the depression, nine, the depression, nine, the sex that I wish would last longer than the second person to tell me that I was beautiful and meant it when I 10 fly off the cusp of what is real, always a contracts, two spirits, health and sickness, 11, juxtaposed beside myself, inside my head, everything feels intense. I can't name it. 12, the babble, the noises, how they pin my ears to the wall, leave me stiff and rigid, a closed mouth, a tear, a smile. Part two, surviving the psych ward. 
Room 11 is the emergency room in the way back corner of UW. And it's the only emergency room that has nothing in it but a bed. There's no medical equipment. It's just a bed with not even a sheet and a pillow. There's nothing in the room. So it's just white walls and these ticking fluorescent lights. I hate those ticket fluorescent lights. And I never sit on the bed anymore when I have to go. I sit on the floor and they strip you of all of your clothes and your shoes. And you just have to put on a robe that they'll give you and a blanket, maybe. And there's a security guard that sits outside the door and it's not like a regular bed. The other hospital doors have sliding doors. This one is just a door and a window. So someone can always look in on you. Badger care. White people want us dead the way that they write us dead quick to pronounce the time of death, tear out our tissue, examine us without consent, write out the toxicology report and contribute to the CDC statistics on black bodies, have coffee laughing about how people still dying from lung cancer, asking why they not picking apples from their own backyards to eat and sometimes, I wish that I could hold them doctor's medical charts and prescribe them racist, a murderer, a criminal, randomly drug test them and have their practice taken away and pay out all those reparations. Their white hands so loosely diagnosing us with no regard for the danger that they put us in, calling the police when therapists share the same building as you. Shame. Is blood from them black bodies tinting your cheeks red. The diagnoses. 2017. T, there is nothing wrong with you. We believe you have conversion disorder. I left neurology running with my walker in my hand, desperately pushing the button for the elevator to come down. And before the elevator door opens, I'm asked so casually, are you okay? And I run, tripping, telling my words, telling my legs to work, telling my mind to stop this act and return to normal before the cops are called. A Black disabled man running past the Lower East Wing of Meritor, they'll say that this patient is a threat or missing. And as I enter the ER parking lot, an officer spots me in his squad car. His high beams search me and I straighten my face, wipe my tears and open the door, hoping that he doesn't follow me. It's raining and foggy. My low beams, my low beams are on and they trail the yellow reflector lines. I look in my rear view mirror. He is there at the light. He turns. Umpteen times I was in the hospital and nosy folks, folks that thought that they cared, friends, family, everyone always asked me, how does it feel? How does it feel? Well, it feels like I have eight arms. Some above my head, others around my waist, some just floating when I have sight of my chest and my hair and my clothes that still don't tell the story. How does it feel? 
It feels like repressed anger sitting at the edge of my esophagus, a burp like skipping hopscotch. Do I reach rage? Do I ingest the seed? Do I breathe off of the cliff? How does it feel? Looking at the side of my face, counting the hairs on my chin, feeling the restraint under my chin, hearing my words, seeing, any ha seeing my hands, grabbing any words to greet the morning, to face the door opening to the hall, to the car, to open the car door and step inside any place and know that today should be different. A diagnosis looming over the choices when I want to change all the choices given to me to check two binary boxes and remember that every change that I need, it costs too many sacrifices. It feels like too much to hold on to. It feels too much. It feels like it's hard to say not having the choices to have only two choices that don't feel comfortable, like an itchy skin, a sweater, a rash that belonged to you, a president that ain't yours, the unsafe choice. A being black and sitting at the intersection of being black and love and true, a black and queer, and trans and masculine and parallel lines that blend together to tell me that being black and disabled is already too heavy, too much time, too much sensitive, add on another oppression. They always saying, baby, you not worth the access and representation. And that feels like slavery been on me. And like new links is on that chain and new hands is on that whip. It feels like they're going to keep killing me too. It feels like they're going to keep killing me too for freedom to be issued to me. It feels like too much. I got to pay just to be free. It feels too heavy. It feels too heavy. Part three, access freedom dreams. The definition of care is to look after, to feel cause or intense provisions to provide the needs of. One, to make an effort made to do something correctly or safely or without more damage. Two, things done to keep someone healthy and safe, painstakingly, or with watchful attention. Three, to have an inclination, concern, or worry. Care is, care is my right to autonomy, to exist interdependently. Care is consent and access and love. Receiving care is not and should not be based on if I am liked or not. Care should just be a human right. Care is leaving evidence and crip guardians like Mia and Alice and Sandy that say care is access, is love, that access is love. When I think of access, I think of the ways that I can abolish the gatekeeping of resources and access hacks that some white disabled folks have figured out. Care is reclaiming crip language like, Re like Leroy. Care work is trait lineages like Leah. Care work I learned and lives in my bones. Care work is Black. I think about how much it matters. 
when I have the space and freedom and feel like I have the right to say no to things. Care is the ability to say how I want things just the way that I want them. Care is respecting that my crip time is valuable, that I should be remembered and considered. Care is giving me the chance to have all of the tools and then explaining them again with time and space for me to ask questions and change my mind about treatment options and not forced to take things or attend things that would only make you feel more comfortable about my disability. Care is accepting that all crip body minds are different. And we should always be organizing to make space and figure out accommodations for folks intentionally. Which brings me to another point. Care is intention. Honey, that's the goal. Care is intention. It's a purpose. Care is intention. It must sit at the intersections. Care is intention. It is desire. Care is consensual. You must be intentional when giving care, when you offer to give care in whatever ways, honey, whether that be pouring a glass of water for a friend or taking someone's garbage out, listening to a friend vent on the phone. All of these acts of care requires a centered yes. Care is a chance to check in with yourself, knowing that you can offer before you commit. Care is knowing no is no. Care is knowing that I don't want to is the answer. And that's all that matters, period. Care is knowing that I don't feel like it is a good enough reason. Care honors the known. Care also doesn't just have to accept anything. Care doesn't use access, food, basic needs as a leverage point to prove a point, punish or reward. Care is just that, an empathetic knowing, an agreement between two people that is consensual for giving and receiving. It's not based on production, value, worth, liking, popularity, or reciprocity. Unless that's y'all agreement. It is an intention that is followed up with an ask for permission and gives and receives or just is care allows us to remain in our dignity and does not harm us. Care holds and sits with the complexities, is flexible in the moment and also holds boundaries. Care is an interdependent, autonomous process that considers all the body minds involved in this exchange of energy and acknowledges and it celebrates the queerness and magic bendery that happens when we consider care to be a constant, evolving, ebb and flow to existing, creating and living together. Thank you. My name is T.S. Banks and you can follow me at LNU Theater Co. on, I on IG or visit my website at lnutheaterco.com. It's in the chat. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, T. <laughs> that was such a gift. Uh, so much affirmation and praise in the Q&A and um, some love um, from your fellow panelists in the little thread. So, uh, my mind is my mind is racing. My heart is open. I have so much that I, I want to reflect on, but I want to make sure that we get to 
Z first, and then we'll transition to the Q&A. So Z, are you ready to go? Yes, I am ready. Just one moment and I will get everything set up. Fabulous, thank you. Hi, hi folks. My name is ZXMica or ZZMica, depending who you say it. I am from the land of Xamica, Jamaica, uh, the indigenous land of the Tainos. I am uh, I am one of the Emerge Fellows, of course. I am a nonprofit grant writer and I'm also a writer, a cultural worker. I work mo mostly in sex workers' rights. I am um, also expanding my like studies, my work into disability justice, and uh, that is how I ended up here today. Um, my work pretty much speaks for itself, and it's quite a few slides, so I'm not going to expound too much on that, except to say that it is to tell you a little bit about my process. So. I came into this fellowship not knowing what it was going to be like. And so I was, I decided to create a project that whatever came out of my experience here. And so the pieces that you've seen were all created this month uh, out of experiences I've had this month, whether within the meetings or outside of the meetings with individuals. Uh, or just stuff that's been going on with me, things that have resonated with me. Um, so without further ado, I am going to share my screen and we will get started. Okay. Just give me a sec, let me move my screen around so that is actually. All right, and if there is any issue seeing, you should be seeing um, a Canva photo at this point. If there's any issue seeing that, please let me know. And if you cannot hear me, if there are any needs that if you need me to slow down, explain something, of course, please interrupt. I do not mind. Or, or please put this in the chat. I do not mind. All right. So the first image description is the moon. Oh, before I go into the image descriptions, I am a dark skinned black person with bleached dreadlocks, head sides shaved. I'm wearing a uh, gold brimmed square glasses. I have red lipstick on. I have a gray shirt that is long sleeved and I have a septum piercing and a left nostril piercing. So the first image here, the moon and the stars in a dark, dark teal sky, black silhouettes of trees and a temple behind a glowing orb. There is a crack in the ground leading up to the temple. In front of the orb is a silhouette of a tree and three people of color harvesting carrots. All right. So my first piece is uh untitled most all these pieces are untitled um the their micro essays and illustrations um so this this description three dilapidated buildings in shades of blue and turquoise a brown hand hovers above the buildings and there are turquoise colored gems coming out of 
the hand on strings. Okay, and I'll read this piece for you. There is no refuge wide enough to shelter the vulnerable parts of me. I am simply too large for the limits of human consideration. Yet, when I build my own shelter, it is torn down to cries of reverse racism and thrown into the pile with segregation. And perhaps it is in fitting company, for my shelter is as, liberated, is as liberatory as desegregation was not. Bomb my shelter and break my bones and force me to walk on splinters. And still, I maintain that with conviction, that whiteness cannot protect me when it is whiteness that creates my oppression. Okay, so I am going to give that a moment and while you're, uh, I'm going to move on to the next screen. Oh uh, no. Okay, so this one, um, the image description is a dark green background. These three photos going down the middle. Top illustration, a neon, a neon green square with a, with a mouth nervously biting fingers. Uh, an illustration two, a long haired person curled in the fetal position on a yellow background. Illustration three, a person wrapped sit sitting huddled in a green blanket on a yellow background. And illustration four, a person rolls a ball of life concerns, computer, uh, car, home, and on the left side is written, they said, do drugs is written across the middle photos. Hey Z, just wanna yes. pop in really just want to pop in really quickly. We're not seeing um, the image that you're describing right now. Oh, okay. Let me see what's going on there then. Yes, I think that is, I think we're good now. Okay. Okay, no problem. This is... All right, and are you still seeing it like full screen? It is full screen now, yes. Okay. Okay, so this piece, uh, this is just a moment because now I have to pull up my image descriptions elsewhere. So I have to like sense just a moment. All right, so I'm having an issue with my image descriptions. Um, would someone, would you be able to read the ones I sent to you, Alex? Um, They're pasted in the chat, Alex. Or, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yep, I can, you want me to read number four right now, Z? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, of course. Um, number four. A minimalist illustration of a mountainscape in shades of brown and green. There is a dark blue green moon coming from behind the mountains. Okay. School was easy, but life was hard. I went faithfully to work, but life was hard. I made my mama proud, but life was hard. And they told me to continue, but life was hard. And when school got hard and I crawled to work on my belly and I stayed there and stopped trying to live in suffering. And when my mama set me free, when catastrophe set like rain clouds over their machinations, they gave me drugs for life. Okay, and the next image, can you read the description for me, please, Alex? Absolutely. And number five, chaotic pink, green, and yellow poster. Speech bubble with words on the top left and on the top right, there is a sun with a butterfly in front of it. 
In the middle are the words, quote, save yourself, end quote, written on a sign with a heart in the background. Block of words in the bottom third of the page with a pink background. Fly, ally, fly away from this reality that anchors me to the burning ground. Save yourselves. For we who watch your freedom know that this burden of writing the mountains toppled by injustice cannot be lain at such delicate feet. Porcelain feet that cannot walk except on shag carpets and streets of gold. Take your birthright and fly away to beauty and peace. Find your sequins and gems wherever your legacy takes you. And thank us in pose for the fabric of humanity, your hero's cane, that flies you away to unknown wonders. Okay, and... All right, and the next image description, please, Alex. Yes. Um, number six, dark blue background, purple flower stamp on the top right, and an orange sun with blue clouds top right. Words, quote, never forget, it, end quote, written between the flower and the sun. There's an ornate gold frame with a burgundy line drawing of a femme person with an orange butterfly on their nose. Okay, and this is my last piece. And I can you just read the last image description for me, please, Alex? Absolutely. Number seven, golden yellow background. Two interlocking busts, one in light blue watercolor and the other in dark blue slash purple shades. An orchid wraps around the upper bus. They took pains to ensure that we never know we had always been whole, but survival meant etching the truth into my chest that I may never again forget. And thank you. Uh, my name is Zexa Michael. Once again, if you would like to reach out to me, um, talk about sex workers' rights, talk about... Uh, any kind of uh, advocacy, any movement work as sex workers' rights is very much uh, an intersectional movement. It is very, it spans a lot of different areas. Um, yeah, just reach out to me. And soon I will have my website up, zxmica.com. Um, so feel free to check that out in the next two or so weeks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Z. Um, I'm wondering if we could get the presenters, the performers uh, on camera for the last couple of minutes of this block to do um, question and answer, or just explore together. Um, again, if you have any questions that you haven't gotten to put in the Q&A, this is the time. Um, I know we had scheduled for 30 minutes for q and I'm wondering, I wanna get um, consent from the panelists first before we go a little bit. Do you, are you open to going maybe like five or 10 over um, into the break? I see Natasha and Z nodding. Oh, and T as well. Okay, great. Um, Y'all, wow. What a way to just kick this off. Thank you so much for sharing all your magic. Um, I see for you, Z, as well, just want to name you're getting affirmations and love in the chat and the Q&A as well. Um, at this moment, I see one question um, in the Q&A. It's directed to T. I'm going to read it to T, but I, I feel like I'm also curious for, for you, Z, and Natasha. I, I imagine that there are threads in your work as well. So um, from Genevieve. Uh, for T, I'm wondering if you have anything published on care and consent. I didn't have the words for it before, and I'd love to give credit where credit's due using that formulation. Looking through the website now, of course, just wondering where to begin. Oh, T, you're muted. 
Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we learned in tech today. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I am working on adding those citations to my website that have been so graciously modeled how to do that by other Crips and I will follow their lead. So I will follow up with that. Um, I just kind of wanted to say, just jump in here. I am honored to be on a performance panel, okay, with Z and with Natasha. Like, y'all, yeah, give me so much hope and strength, um, but also the way that you presented what you know that lives in the body is just so overwhelming and so beautiful. Um, I will never forget this day, and thank you for sharing with me. Thank you, T. I, I, I would just echo that for both of you, T and Z, just, um, you know, we've gotten to know each other on this, like, sort of surface level, and I feel like today just went, <laughs> you know, and the, like the elevator just took us to all new depths of knowing and sharing space with each other. I'm just grateful. I, um, I'm curious because I'm always like, Z, thank you. Um, I'm so excited that I got to meet y'all because the connections will last for a lifetime. Um, and I'm so grateful. I'm going to keep saying that. Um, and also I'm just always curious, artist to artist, like, what is y'all practice and to call in, you know, if there are some secrets or some gems um, that go into allowing you to create and get into that space where you let go. So are there some things that you need or something in the environment that you need to like get you there? Like, let me know. Something I've definitely learned about my own creative practice is that I have to often set the stage for myself, like literally decorate my environment, like move my little like keys around on my, on my shelves. Um, I have a little, like, I call it my, my Ori altar, my little, you know, yeah, <laughs> gotta have my little like ode to myself in the corner. And, you know, sometimes I'll change out what books are there or I'll set the incense or I'll, you know, bring in a different piece of fabric and getting myself in like cozy fabrics is also part of it too. And I'm, you know, as I've talked about like ritual in my piece earlier, that I think that's definitely where that comes from that like, our ancestors did that too. You're going to go do something important. You're going to go build the space. You're going to construct your altar. You're going to do the things. Um, and so I think that's a big, like that's the big secret, I guess, the secret that isn't a secret. But it, it's very hard for me to create without that, which is why I frequently don't, I don't spend a lot of time in like music studios, traditional music studios, because they aren't always set up that way. Um, so I like, I mean, I know I get more background noise than the average musician, but I, I like being in my own space. Yeah, it just it feels feels more right for me. For me, I would say, and this is this is why I tell everybody this: like the idea of wasting time is a scam. It's a scam, y'all. Like when you're when you sit there and you cannot get it done and you're just staring out into space, that is your body, that is your brain working through something. So I always encourage everyone to make time to waste time. Like just sit and stare into space for hours on end because you will be surprised. Like that is the most important thing to my practice, like being able to just, and which, you know, unfortunately something I wouldn't have if I wasn't disabled, but you know, I, I, I appreciate that, you know, where it, when it, silver linings, um, but yeah, make time to waste time. So yeah, that's my advice. I love that. Um, I I need things to get me comfortable. Um, yeah, I need my pillows. I need probably a playlist. It's a few artists on there that just get my writings going. Or I like to listen to Lofi 
a lot lo-fi how do you say it child I like to that get me going um and I really love going on the YouTubes and checking out people's work or going on the site or the Instagrams the tickety talk, all of that I like going on there and um you know being able to take in my friend's art is the way that propels me a lot into mine. Thank you for sharing your process with me. Thank you for that invitation, T. I know you mentioned before this that you were really curious to explore like art practice. And there's a question in the chat um, from Corbett uh, for you all. What do you find makes it easier or harder to do your work as a Black disabled artist? I'm gonna call that question out right now because I like, who, who's, that's not, that, that question rubs me the wrong way personally, because it suggests that there's anything easy about, like, the, Black people do not carry privilege as a result of being Black. So I don't understand where it would get easy to be a Black disabled artist. We do not carry privilege because of being Black or because of being disabled. Ease comes from privilege. So I'm just going to say that just out the gate. Um, what makes it harder is that we always have our realities questioned. Like we always have to show up defending who we are. We have to show up hard every day because somebody is going to try to negate our experience every single day. And sometimes the people doing that are like the closest to us. <laughs> I think there's so much, right? Like the impact of generational trauma on all of us is so strong. And it, it's, it often, yeah, it comes from like the, the closest points in your lineage sometimes can be the toughest friction points. Um, I think that like just to amplify everything that Z just said that makes it harder too is that sometimes we have um, this intense need to build community and kin laterally um, and that you know while it's beautiful the result is beautiful I feel like this is a thing you're going to hear me say multiple times today while the result is beautiful the process is really hard and really painful and there's a lot of grief associated with that as well. So just want to name name that too. There's there's beauty and there's grief in all of it. I also wanted to lift up this question around um, again speaking to the the connections or the uh, the resonance in your work. Uh, Neil is wondering how all of you see your work reflected in each other. There's so many intersecting threads and interested to hear your thoughts on access, care, creative connections. It sounds like a lot of you either work like in collectives or just have collaborated with a lot of different people. So just curious if you could share more about that. Um, I, okay, my mind is in a million places and, um, also is just quite taken by just how real the art is. Um, I deeply, deeply resonate. First off, Natasha, your <laughs> work broke me open. Your voice yeah, I don't really know how to talk about this question because I'm stuck on the fact that I think I entered another portal um, and I shot through that mug and sitting there and then Z, I saw so many revelations and the it, I'm stuck. So I'm, I'm just going to name that and I'm stepping back. Just... You portaled me, T. <laughs> Portals, I'm always 
in awe of, of, of portals and artists who can like build portals or build like ZU constructed. I felt like each image was its own like world that you just like pull this into. <laughs> and I'm always so in awe of, of artists who are able to just do that so seemingly effortlessly. And I feel like there are so many of us in this cohort that have demonstrated that, that it's just been like, it's, it's humbling, it's inspiring and exciting. And it also like, this is the, here it is again, it's the like love and the grief that there's also this weird sort of like rage sometimes that like rises up in me that like the world doesn't like get it and they don't deserve us, man. <laughs> like just, yeah, yeah. I, I feel you on the, on the like stuck, like I'm just, I'm in that, I'm in that place, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I actually like, I'm really looking forward to like your projects coming to fruition, Natasha, because like, I feel, I feel like it could be a very like useful spiritual aid. Um, that's the, like, that's what comes to me, like when you were doing your Skillshare and when you were and this, this afternoon, um, so yeah, and I really do like that you're making that accessible and like, you know, like that's important. And T, like, oh my, like that vivid imagery of that room with no pillow. Bam, room with no pillow. Um, that says it all. Uh, and yeah, and I, I feel so affirmed when I hear people speak those stories because I don't usually see or hear them. Like, it's kind of hush-hush, like, yeah. Yeah, I feel like we just, in such a sacred space, and I want to protect that also as well, that there are so many folks that are being able to witness um, kind of what we just brought and I just kind of want to honor that I think most of the conversation here is going to lie between the care that I know I've already received from you all, but like in connecting further um, from this, because um, I think also too, in speaking to the point Z that you were saying, as far as being like a spiritual tool for healing. Um, yeah, I just feel so deeply that, yeah, this the, the need to commune and, and protect our sacred spaces like in our art. I just want to be mindful of our time. I'm thinking maybe I'll extend this one last question before we go into break. Um, Danielle asked, uh, what is next for all of you? What can we expect to see, next projects or goals? Um, where can we find or follow you to be a part of it and support? I know that all of you have shared some of this in some way, um, but just want to give you an opportunity to do like one last plug, any shout outs, um, any teas uh, that you want to get people excited or invite them into to the to the magic that you're weaving in the future. So uh, I'll go first. So I work with an organization called the Best Practices Policy Project. It is not explicitly a disability justice organization this is a sex workers rights policy advocacy mutual aid um, organization but in doing so we do practice disability justice because it's all interconnected um and yeah and that is where a lot of my work is hosted at the moment um and i am working to get my portfolio together on my website uh, within the next few weeks so there will be that um, but in the meantime, you can you can follow best practices policy project um, on 
the social medias. Um, and uh, if I put if I put something in the chat, can everyone see it? Or is it just the you panelists? Just, if you switch the who it goes to, if you click that and then you um, okay. select everyone, it'll go. Okay. All right, yeah, so I will draw best practices, policy projects, information in the chat, and I hope y'all go follow and give money. Um, I could go quickly. Um, wellness check that I wrote, that I read from today, um, that'll be available uh, fall 2025. I'm self-publishing it as well as I've done with a lot of my other chat books. Um, and you can find all that information at lnutheaterco.com. I think someone dropped some chat um, links in the chat or follow me on IG at lnutheaterco. I can similarly be found on I IG um, at Black Creative Healing. Um, BlackCreativeHealing.com is the website. Um, the album is going to drop sometime in 2024. I honestly don't know exactly when because I'm having a baby in November of 23. <laughs> and that's sort of like where my attention is going to be shifting after this um, alongside the album creation. But I absolutely anticipate that that's going to be like that's going to be part of the album process. <laughs> like there'll probably be a song about that experience because being pregnant and disabled is a whole trip. <laughs> But um, yeah, so that's sort of what's what's next for me is is baby and eventually album. Um, but the website and Instagram will will definitely have all the deets. <laughs> well, thank you all for privileging us with this uh, peek into your sanctuary, um, sharing your art, sharing your wisdom. Um, I, We'll just reiterate again, the Q&A box is just flush with affirmations and praise and gratitude. And I echo those sentiments. So thank you for sharing, um, T, Z, and Natasha. Um, with that, I will send us into our break. Uh, we'll return at 3.30 with our next panel. Um, I can't wait to, yeah, just see more magic from, from our fellows. So see you soon. Welcoming you back into this space in whatever way feels good for you in your mind or body mind right now. Um, up next, we will be uh, digging into scholarship activism in disability studies. Uh, one of the main um, threads or North Stars of the Emerge Fellowship was um, bridging scholarship and activism, really interrogating how that shows up in disability studies and how it's informed by disability justice and other movement work. Um, we've got three of our fellows who have uh, volunteered to share about their perspectives and takes on this topic. And so I wanna invite in um, Isabella, Natasha and Z to join me on camera. Um, as they join, just to give a sense of how this next hour is gonna go, uh, I'm gonna give the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Of course, Z and Natasha already have introduced themselves. If there's anything that you would like to add specifically in um, relationship to like why you opted for this panel or what um, scholarship activism speaks to you, that could be a way that we go or you could just pass. Um, so we'll definitely give Isabella an opportunity. And then um, I've got some questions generated as a moderator. Um, I love just having the panel be in conversation with each other. So um, I'll be here if you need me. I'll throw some questions out every now and then, but please ask each other things just like um, the previous panel did. And then we'll make time at the end um, for audience Q and A. So if things are sparking, if what's coming up is really resonating with you, please put it in the chat or in the Q and A and I will lift that up at the end. But um, enough for me. I want to turn it to the brilliance right in front of you. Um, Isabella, if you would do us um, the honor, if you want to introduce yourself first, and then um, Z and Natasha, if there's anything else that you'd like to add before we get to the, the formal panel, um, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Hi, everyone. My name is Isabella. Um, 
Oh, I think my computer actually froze. Oh, is it back? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. My name is Isabella. As you've noticed, my computer is very laggy, so <laughs> that might happen again. My pronouns are she, day. Uh, my visual description is I'm a light-skinned mixed woman um, with Latin heritage and also um, indigenous heritage. Um, I have wavy, curly hair. Um, I have gold glasses and some gold earrings as well, and I'm wearing a beige shirt. Um, I'm participating on this panel as someone with like an artistic background. I'm a filmmaker, and that's what my project is about. And I was interested in this panel because I'm not necessarily an academic, but I am interested in how activism and art can play a role in academics. And I'll turn it over to my amazing fellows. The hover over the unmute button, <laughs> it's, it's infamous. <laughs> uh, Natasha Thomas, uh, they, she pronouns. I, uh, as was said, I introduced myself and my work a little bit earlier, but um, similar interest in the panel on the angle of art and activism, but also as someone who's been in academia for going on a decade now, <laughs> I feel like I've seen all the like the ins, the outs, the uglies, the, the possibilities. Um, and yeah, I was just excited to enter into that conversation in this space with my colleagues. So I'll pass it to Z. Hi folks, Z, XM Micah, pronouns they, them. And uh, yeah, so my background is uh, both grassroots nonprofit work and also um, in grassroots organizing, as well as in as well as an academic background. And uh, yeah, so I look forward to this panel. Thank you all. Um, it's evident already we've got a, a kaleidoscope of, of lived experiences um, within academia, art, organizing, and activism. And so maybe just to start us off and help contextualize um, like your perspectives or your relationship to this concept, um, what, is, what does it mean to do scholar activism um, and, and how does scholar activism show up in your work? Um, anybody who would like to get us started, go for it, and then we can pop one from there. I'll start. Um, so for me, scholar activism is returning knowledge to the people who create it. And it is not a matter of like bringing more knowledge into academia as many people practice uh, disability justice in my opinion. Um, it is more for me personally, it is more about reattributing that knowledge that has been attributed to people who it did not come from to the communities that it has come from and in doing so making it accessible once more uh, putting it back into the type of language that birthed it and just um and that shows up in my work in my attempts to like make documents more legible uh I do a lot of write I am a writer uh both fiction nonfiction creative I do it all um and part of what part of a big part of what I do is I try to not just put the statistics and the numbers and what we call empirical data, but also the emotion that is attached because that is what we really have in common. We all feel anger and fear and joy. And yeah, and that, yeah, that's scholar activism for me. I would echo that. Yeah. Um, the the core piece of scholar activism is that bringing it back to the people. Um, I think if there's anything that's meant to go back to the academy, it's the noticing of like metaphorical blood on the floor. <laughs> like, hey, do you see the damage? Okay, cool. Y'all tend to that. I'm gonna go tend to the people. <laughs> you know, that's what I feel like um, that like the holding is in, in scholar activism is, is 
yeah, is naming the damage inside the academy while tending to the wounds in the community. Yeah, I honestly would just echo the same thing. I think I'm more interested in praxis, praxis versus like theory. You know, um, I find that what's happening on the ground and within community organizing and what's coming from the people is far more important and will always kind of uplift us more than the academy itself. And so I'm just echoing what my fellow said basically, but I think that's where like the real revolution in disability rights movement lies. It's within the community itself versus like an article or a book. Oh, can I also add one thing? I think like <laughs> scholarship activism as well would really benefit from um, being more accommodating. I find it's always been very ableist in a lot of different ways and it gatekeeps dis disabled people in a lot of, like the most immediate example that comes to mind is that um, the absence of like plain language, like it's really hard to enter academia because it's already so hard for a lot of us to process and we're just gate kept not just in terms of like classism and racism, but just also um, accommodation wise. And that's also what I'm interested in, like how can I make work that's accessible versus something that's just dense and more superior <laughs> than myself and my community. I'm so I was just taking notes to to draw on from later already. You all have helped uh, articulate such a clear vision of uh, um, what scholar activism can be, and also where you see um, its failures, right? Or people who are not embodying kind of this liberatory, like decolonized uh, perspective. I particularly Natasha, I feel like this this image of like attending to the blood on the floor, like that's very evocative, right? And um, I, part of what Amani said in her keynote about kind of attending to yourself in the process, you know, I'm I'm curious, I know we're, this is not necessarily a question I had prepared and so let me know if we can, you wanna just move on, but for you all as you are, um, vehicles or vessels of it sounds like you're like conduits of this more liberatory scholar activism like as you're pointing out these harms or pointing out ways that um communities are being gatekept like you are also part of those communities how how is that what is that experience like or just how has that been for you I mean, it's definitely an intense experience to have to say, not only is there blood on the floor, but some of it's mine, <laughs> you know? And like that, um, I think Imani tapped into some of that too in, in their keynote as well, like that constantly having to justify not only your own existence, but your need to preserve your own existence is, a, is very taxing. Um, and it often involves a lot of leaving spaces that aren't safe or having to step away to provide care for yourself and feeling this ridiculous amount of guilt because often you're the only dark-skinned person in that space. You're the only queer person. You're the only disabled person. And when you have to step out to take care of yourself, you feel this like I'm leaving this gap that there's nobody there to do the thing. But the reality is there's not going to be anybody there for an even longer time if I don't step away and take care of myself. <laughs> um, and I think also like what's been crucial for me in terms of my own like survival is having a place to go to. So I'm not just like leaving the harm space and like licking my wounds in private. I'm going to my community that I've spent the time to like cultivate and build and connect to and resource with so that they can nourish me and I can pour back into them and we can support each other and, um, I think that's the only way that any of us really survives is being able to go back into our community, get the resources we need before we have to return to these spaces that continue to cause harm. Um, yeah, I think that's the closest I can get to describing that experience is that it's a, 
Yeah, it's a lot. Um, if I could answer the question, I just think it's, for me, it makes me sad to like hear the question because I kind of feel like it shouldn't be this way. <laughs> like, I think in all these institutions, like it's inevitable. It's not even like this may cause you harm. It's like inevitable for like black, brown and people of color to be harmed because there is like a sacrificial component involved, especially when you're multiply marginalized. It comes like at a cost. And I feel like that's unfortunate. It's more than unfortunate. It's not sustainable. I think it in a way really hurts our communities and kills our communities. Um, and there could a lot could be learned if the disability community, especially in academia, were to really um, lean on other politics, like really studied intersectionality and really look at what it means to be not just white and disabled, but have other, um, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit, <laughs> but I just feel like the question itself makes me really feel like it's it's not fair for my fellows and for anyone who experiences like having to like give so much of yourself in order for others to thrive. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm hearing uh, in the, the current state uh, as it is with, with these institutions, with academia, it feels like an inevitability in a way that it shouldn't, right? This like harm cycle and um, hearing ways that you all are talking about making things accessible to communities so the community just has it. I think Isabella, you said earlier, like praxis over the academy. It's not about kind of just um, publishing to publish, right? Or just being in the tower. It's really about like, how is this serving us? Is this helping our community sustain, deepen, grow, um, heal? Um, and particularly from this disability studies lens, like the lack of intersectionality or the lack of uh, additional like rigorous politic is, is uh, like setting up multiply marginalized disabled people for like failure or harm um, within those spaces. I'm, I'm curious if either in your work, in ways that you wanna share here um, or other people's work, where have you seen um, like possibility models of people successfully um, like divesting from academia in scholar activism or um, I loved Z, I got a flavor of like this like transactional relationship with academia where you're like, you don't get my magic, like I'm taking from you and then I'm, I'm bringing it back to my people. So like, are there examples that you all wanna lift up or things in your own work that you're finding um, are exciting examples of, of those like wins or those uh, successes? Some of the wins are hard to talk about, like in a weird way, because they involve, you have to be kind of subversive. <laughs> like you have to have co-conspirators um, on the inside who are willing to like help you make some things happen. Um, I remember like some of my first interactions with social workers that were like, we have all this grant money to spend and it's gonna go away and we don't wanna lose the opportunity to like help the community. And so you see people buy like, ridiculous equipment that's never going to be used and you know and it's just like such a waste of money that flows in and out of the academy but I was watching a social worker go you know what I'm going to do I'm going to buy grocery store gift cards and she just went like nuts grocery stores gas stations like as many places that she could think of that the people in the community she was working in frequented um and she got grant money to do those things and then every meeting that she had with community members she was just like handing out gift cards and I was like that's really smart you know like you have to like find these like these little inroads to be able to do stuff it's almost like I remember when the uprisings in Minneapolis were happening and that target was looted that like somebody had written on the back door they were like free stuff <laughs> like I feel like sometimes that's what we have to be as like disabled activists on the inside being like come here this is where the things are this is where we can help each other you know and it's like 
yeah, like I said, sometimes that's hard to talk about. <laughs> and so that again, comes back to how important it is to like build these relationships so that we can share these like tips and tricks with each other. Um, and again, this ties back to the sort of like righteous rage that I've been mentioning in other like spaces for this fellowship where I'm just like really mad that we have to even do that, you know? Cause again, like Isabella said, it shouldn't be that way, but that's like, that's where I've found some of the possibilities are like, how can you find ways to kind of like tweak the thing and get your community what it needs while doing whatever you have to do to look good on paper. So what All right, I forgot I lost my chain of thought. Um, I can speak from the perspective. Oh, unless you still want to go Z. Well, I'm I'm happy to wait. Okay. <laughs> I can speak from the perspective, I think, of art and film. I found that um what helps me is kind of looking prioritizing care and skill from what we traditionally think is care and skill when I've like approached projects in a different way or like let go of my ego or what people think filmmaking or art making is I found so much care and so much new more new ways of thinking and I think that helps um move past like all the trauma and the burden that these institutions can create you know, when you prioritize people first all the time, there's just like this whole new world that opens up. And I think that's so important for our community um, because when we rely on each other, we build ourselves up in like in a country and a system that's not thinking of us in the first place, you know? So I'm also losing my train of thought. It's a good question, <laughs> but I would say people first in any process really helps. If I could add something really quick, it just made me think like, I think disabled people have such a unique way of thinking because we have to have so many workarounds. Like our work is so valuable, especially when we work together. And so what you said, Z, felt really moving to me because when you like actually let multiply marginalized people do their thing, it's just so cool and groundbreaking because our minds and the way we move throughout the world is already so revolutionary. So I think all of that is can be very moving and beautiful if given the space to thrive. Are there ways that any of you want to highlight in your work? that you feel like this innovation that Isabel is talking about of like being creative and not just thinking about for your body mind how to create art, but also creating art and work that is accessible to your communities. Like, are there any cool workarounds, whether they be big or small or innovations that you feel like you've come upon that have uh, supported your effort to make what you're creating more, more accessible to the people that that you prioritize or you're centering? Um, I am working on a project with, or designing a project in the very early stages with best practices that is kind of a record keeping project that I think kind of like responds well to this question. Um, and what it is, is it is the, for funding, we're seeking funding for it because it's a lot of labor and we're building it as a research project, but what does research do for the community? You know, like they, you know, the funders want to see a research proposal, but research as academia sees it is exploitive like it just is and if you're going to do it by the book by the by academia's book you're going to do it in an exploitive way and part of the challenge here was is getting is getting it to tick the boxes without being extractive and those two 
seem almost mutually exclusive. And uh, I part of one of the workarounds that I that we come up with, not I, like the sex worker community as a whole has come up with, um, is community-based research. And in this case, like in the case of the project that we're trying to develop and get funding for, it would be an arts-based research, research project, thereby not holding, not beholding people to the academic language or feeling like they have to write something that has to be peer reviewed, but rather for them to tell their stories. And then we can worry about the reports later. Um, and that works as an, a place for them to workshop their work. It acts as a place for people to get valuable like research skills, job skills. Um, and yeah, so that's my hope for that project. Um, yeah. I would echo that like value of community engaged research, community based research, participatory action, like finding all of those like, um, I don't know, fringe is probably the wrong word, but you know, those like those things that allow you to check the boxes without being exploitative. Like I can put in an IRB proposal, I don't know how this is going to turn out. And that's the whole point, <laughs> you know, because it is community engaged research. The community will tell me what they want. And just being able to say that and have, you know, researches or um, resources from the, um, all of the people that have gone before us and built, you know, and fought for their work to be honored as academic and honored as, you know, rigorous um, and all of the things that quantitative researchers like to sort of look down on us for, you know, to be able to say, no, you try doing this this way in a way that honors your participants lived experiences. That is rigorous work. That is, that is academic work. And all of those folks who have fought and built those, um, those resources for us to be able to point to and say, other people have done this, this is valid, so we're going to do it too. You know, that's, um, that's incredibly important. And I'm like mindful of that always, that there are lineages upon lineages that we're stepping into as we do this work. Yeah, and I'd say in my work, um, accessibility, when I prioritize it in a way that's also kind of on your script time, it brings out really interesting dynamics because you're kind of communicating with the other person in a very intimate way. So you're connecting to someone and their stories. I'm a documentary filmmaker, I should have started off with that. So in my work, it's been really beautiful because you're just kind of connecting to someone and how they experience the world in a way that's not ticking boxes, that's not extractive. You're just asking um, about who they are, basically, like what they need to succeed. And that has created a lot of really interesting stories, but also has allowed the other person to um, collaborate with me that in a way that uplifts them and gives them their agency. And I'm more than happy to let that happen, you know, like collaboration and accessibility in that collaboration is very cool. I want to echo too, like, thank you, Isabella, for like tying it back into like the art piece as well, because I was just thinking as you were sharing um, about how that interfaces with your work as a filmmaker, like for me as a musician, a lot of my like work lately, especially working with like electronic music and stuff like that is building sound banks of just like, you know, you have an interview with somebody and then you ask them to go back through the transcript and pick out like, what's your aha moment or like your big takeaway. And now we're going to put that into a program and stick it on a loop. And like what emerges for you when you hear your own words come back at you over and over and over again, what do you want to create from that? And then like having new things get generated then. And I just, I love the way that like engaging creatively in our communities yields even more data and even more like healing and and care um, because we keep like the more that you poke, <laughs> the more you excavate and it just, it keeps on giving. I feel like the more that, that the three of you are, are 
kind of fleshing this out, the more it feels like the the this hyphen right of scholar activism, like it, it's starting to feel more diffuse or more kind of like two sides of the same coin. I really appreciate this like re um, definition of scholarship, right? Which is communities are wise. Communities have you know generations and and you know all of this experience that is critically important for everyone to be aware of and we should be turning to and turning to that is activism which then by investing in that activism you're like becoming scholarly in in this this like healing wisdom and and art making um skills i uh yeah i'm i'm just curious as you all have kind of been embarking in this fellowship together in a cohort, again, we saw in you know the, the presentation panel, there was so much resonance in what people were doing. I'm just curious if there are any reflections around scholarship activism that came up for you um, in, during your time in the fellowship, you know, whether it was good, rough, you know, healing, hard. All of the above. <laughs> um, I think this fellowship was really hard. <laughs> this was very emotionally intense in a lot of ways. And um, yeah, wait, can you repeat the question again? I was like lost in my head. Um, if you don't mind repeating the question. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just um, offering space to to name or reflect ways that the fellowship um, has either informed your relationship to scholar activ scholarship activism, or if it, you know any any reflections on what's come up for you um, in this time that we've had together. Um, for me, I would say I I noticed a very clear I think disconnect like we were talking about earlier on between like institutions and academia and people, you know, I think we witnessed ableism in its own form in, our, in the fellowship. We witnessed anti-blackness in its own form in the fellowship and naming it and working through it, I think revealed this really big disconnect that exists still in our culture between what disabled people, but especially disabled people of color experience and what institutions think <laughs> we experience. And um, it, I mean, it makes, it hurts me and I can't even imagine how it has hurt people who have been even more harmed by this. And just watching T perform earlier, I was like, wow, this poetry is like real, you know? <laughs> That's exact, it speaks so much to like, the medical industry, the psychiatric complex that exists in this country, like that to me is much more potent than like a lot of things that exist in academia. And so I think that disconnect was very evident for me and kind of sparked a lot of reflection. Yeah, I think it was really indicative of how like, even as much as you can like conceptualize around a thing, plan or prepare for a thing you know the thing might still rear its head I remember in our first like session together we talked about anti-blackness and how we wanted to be like caring for each other and and trying to be proactive about making sure that didn't happen and it still did <laughs> you know and we we banded as a cohort you know to be able to to take care of each other um and that that was you know yay that we did that but again like we shouldn't have had to and that sucked um and there are still debts to be paid like literally and metaphorically you know from from that experience and so I'm um yeah just continuing to name it I feel like has been my my main thing, but I also feel like I've been doing a lot of like self-preservation and I know that folks like T and I wanna name Ebony too, like have really like stepped, like I don't wanna say stepped up because it's not like a go champ. It's like they have put themselves 
on the line, you know, they've put themselves out there um, to make things happen. And that's tremendous and awe-inspiring to behold, but also like shouldn't have had to happen. Yeah. Uh, for me, the fellowship was a very, I, I value it as exposure to the ways that there's more to be done and the ways that more can be done. Um, it was, this is by far the most accessible space I've ever been in. And just by being here, I learned a lot about accessibility uh, that, you know, I hope to take on into other work. And I also find, I also find that the experience here kind of acted as a reality check, like Natasha said, like, you know, like you come in and you think, you know, of course, we're going to be cared for. And while the intention was there, I I think, the, yeah, the intention was there, but we kind of ended up learning about ourselves and each other in ways that perhaps we did not intend to or expect to. I think those come from a variety of sources too, you know, like that's part of the the reality check is that like the planning and the prepping is all part of a little bubble that doesn't consider that there's going to be outside people that come in and that harm could come in from the outside. There's going to be things that you think you're nested inside of that are secure that will all of a sudden be like, nope, that's not so secure. Like I'm thinking about that new girl episode where Schmidt and Cece move into their new house and they're all excited about how secure it is when all of a sudden they start discovering these new points of entry as Schmidt keeps getting mad, <laughs> discovering new ways that people can break into their house. <laughs> like that was part of the reality check here too. I just want to yeah, express gratitude for the ways that you all are naming and willing to share about your experiences. I feel like really uh, struck me when Amani said talking about learning out loud and the way that you all are like leaving evidence in this experience and um, lifting up people who are being like, especially uh, on the front lines, but also just, you know, ways that um, aspects of of our attempts to foster scholarship activism, both like succeeded and, you know, left people feeling hurt and disappointed. And um, I can't remember who mentioned it. I, I believe it was you, Natasha, but just the way that within academia it can be so easy for multiply marginalized people to feel isolated, you know, or disconnected from community or um, I, I, I feel like those experiences can make it feel like it's important to just like duck down and just try to get through or survive. And I just, I've seen the ways that you all have um, acted interdependently and, and lifted each other up to ensure that like no one kind of like shrinks into just like accepting that um, pattern, right? Or that cycle. And so just very grateful for, um, for that, that, possibility model on that work um, that, that people have done. Um, I just want to do a time check. We're at 410. I wanted to leave at least uh, 15 minutes for um, Q&A and then and five for closing. Before we go into some of the questions I see here in the uh, box, are there any other kind of just like lingering thoughts around scholar activism? Um, that you all have that you might want to ask each other or um, that feel like maybe, you know, I, I, I can ask big questions and I know sometimes it's hard to like follow the train of thought. So if anything else has come back to you, um, yeah, I just want to make space for that right now.
you know, I had some things and then I forgot them. <laughs> so, I'll just wait for the Q&A. <laughs> yeah, my brain is very full. <laughs> That's very real. This has been a, 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 I feel like a generous read is calling this a saturating month. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I can empathize with that for sure. In that case, I will um, read some of the questions that are here in the Q&A. Um, also to the panelists, if there are questions in here that you're like, I want to go to that one. If you have access to it, just let me know, pop in. You know, I want to make sure that this time feels generative for you as well. Um, I, uh, I feel like there was a question that I wanted to grab. Um, Jennifer asks, do you have any suggestions for those who are in very rural or extremely underserved areas who might not be able to find community, but find the mainstream options such as Facebook or Twitter to be inaccessible? Yeah, I've been meditating on that question since I saw it come in because I was like, yeah, the mainstream spaces are not safe anymore. And the other ones, like I saw somebody mention Mastodon, like so many of those are so new that I don't trust them either. Like even if they feel like they're a little bit safer because of the, the community that's being built there. Like I was one of the people who, you know, jumped on Project Mushroom when that started and then watch how that caved, you know, and that's that's hosted within Mastodon, so you can find Black Creative Healing um, there. I think we were able to use all of the letters because on Twitter we were Black Creative HG. <laughs> um, so I can't remember if our Mastodon handle is also that or if we got the whole word in there because obviously I don't spend a whole lot of time there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a challenge to find the right space because with, uh, I mean, I'll at least speak for Black Creative Healing in particular, like our community is largely online, originating from people who had met in person in other spaces, and then the network sort of grew from there. But our online spaces, like I mentioned, Discord, um, and that's like people access that space through the website. There's a, there's a Google sheet um, that people fill out. Um, not because we're looking to like make it really hard for you to come in, but because we want people to be really intentional about why do you want to be in this space? <laughs> um, you know, um, and that's part of how we keep ourselves as safe as we can is by making people be really intentional about why they enter those spaces. So we found a, you know, virtual community that works well within Discord. Um, for non-Black folks, we've got a Patreon structure. Um, and that has been working decently. It's pretty small at this point, um, but a lot of that is because we want you know, folks to be like, if you're gonna be <laughs> co-conspirators in this, put your money where your mouth is. And so it's largely dominant folks that are, that are supporting that space, but it does, we do have events that are racially mixed in that space and you know, that folks are welcome to, to participate in. But it is hard when you're rural and you're physically isolated and you can't, um, yeah, you can't quite find community in those big, big, big spaces like Twitter or Facebook. But attending events like this, you know, getting, making these little connections with people that are creating like pockets of community online can be incredibly valuable. And so I guess if there were anything I could say to encourage the, the questioner on that front, it's keep coming to things like this and making connections where you can, um, because you never know where those might lead. And sometimes that can yield some of the most nourishing relationships. There are people I, I am connected to now that I've never met in person, including people in this cohort that are, you know, um, people that, that I have a very unique relationship with that I don't have with anybody else, you know? So that's, there's something to be said for that when you can find those spaces. Yeah, this is very hard. Natasha gave a great answer, but I've also been thinking about this because it just sucks. Like, <laughs> I am I understand your pain. It's really hard to find community, especially when a lot of things are just not accessible to you. I face the same issue. I just, want to add if it's helpful 
um, maybe starting with in-person events. That's what I used to do, like finding local organizations that focus on um, the kind of communities you're interested in. And then kind of little by little, you start to create a community. Um, and I used to like go to local organizations and then just talk to one person and that would lead me to talk to another person, but just kind of trying my best to put myself out there, which is unfortunate, it shouldn't be that way. But I think that sometimes helps. Uh, I, that is a question that goes to bed with me at night and wakes up with me in the morning because it is, I also find it very difficult to find community and it is, it is, I mean, for me personally, online spaces are more accessible than in-person spaces, but even then, you know, making those connections, a whole different set of challenges. So I don't have an answer. I, yeah, it's just solidarity. And someone in the, the Q&A box, it wasn't necessarily a question, but I, I feel like Natasha's um, naming of Patreon um, for non-Black folks as a, a platform for like resourcing, right? Um, it tied in with somebody was speaking about the the duality of like mutual aid and and charity, and I I, th I feel like part of the like siren song of academia and institutions is like resources, you know, and like a lot of like uh, money. Uh, you know, platforms, all of these kind of things. And I think that things that you all spoke about, like, you know, um, community led research, right? Participatory action research, these things are really incredible. And then also like, you might not have the funds or the platform to share out the incredible work that's happening. I'm just curious how you all kind of navigate that tension or if you found ways to be creative to resource uh, more like community-led projects that don't rely on kind of turning to academia or these institutions for funding or, or resourcing. Um, you know, it's really powerful work. Um. In my experience, and in or in my in this corner of the movement that I like exist within, like I find that we have the in, we have an infrastructure. We have the infrastructure that we can afford, and we're doing amazing things with it. You know, amazing things on a shoestring budget. And however, we're serving communities that are economically oppressed, just like out and out, no questions asked, like economically oppressed. A sex worker goes on the street, they get arrested. Um, so there's not a lot of a lot of uh, there's not a lot of funds that we can say, oh, we're gonna lean on, you know, black sex workers for to support this program because black sex workers don't got it. Another place that scholar activism can come in is that with the skills that we get in academia, we can use those skills to push or nudge the redistribution of resources from the formalized um, institutions and institutes of learning and you know places that are uh, held in such high esteem and get it to the places where and get resources to the places where it actually does good. So there is definitely a need for these institutions and even more so a need for them to get out of our way. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, yeah, we just need the support and all we need is the funding because everything else we kind of have. Right, yeah, because I'll definitely say like the Patreon part of the reason why we made it 
was because we didn't want to be charging black people for our services like wellness retreats and the types of things that we were looking to do with black creative healing people make a lot of money off of and we were not wanting to be those people that were asking folks to fork over ridiculous amounts of money for for something that really like healing is our birthright you know like we deserve it <laughs> um and so that's part of why the patreon exists because everything that we can do inside there um can be supported by dominant folks, largely dominant folks who have the funds to help support it. But what Z said about like pulling resources from the academy is also like that sort of ties back to that whole like looting of target thing that I mentioned, you know, like that's what sometimes we got to do. We get these skills for a reason so that we can get the resources and get them redistributed to where they need to go. But um like a lot of times I'll be real too in saying that like some of the grants and things that we get that like, yeah, they can like buy out my teaching time and they can, you know, help me provide resources for the community. But sometimes those of us doing the work, like we don't necessarily get anything. And so that's part of the other reason why the Patreon exists too. Cause it's like, we aren't always able to pay ourselves, you know, with the funds that we're getting inside of academia. Like we aren't all, rich <laughs> you know like we're paycheck to paycheck too you know so like that's a dynamic that also has to be named as well yeah i'd say listening to what z said um we're just all kind of surviving like most under surf communities are surviving and um i think when you brought up the looting and target, a lot of people got upset over that, but what people don't understand is that when you put it in the context of a long history of certain communities being like deprived of serious economic resources or even food scarcity, all these things, there's a huge context behind why multiply marginalized communities don't get the funds. And, and now we're kind of like, <laughs> stuck in this limbo of having to be scrappy but also having to learn how to play the system so we can serve our people and it's really complicated and it's really complex and it's hard <laughs> but that's how I've survived this far you know I'm very scrappy I'm very DIY and then I'll try to sell pe people something that I'm not but it works somehow <laughs> I'm just playing the system at this point I think because I know I do it with for the love of my community. Yes, I love that scrappy energy. And it's very clear the three of you have so much ingenuity and like industriousness to know how to um, navigate these things. And I think even more importantly have offered wisdom of reminding us that we need to dismantle systems that like create the norm that industriousness should be the norm, right? Or that industriousness can't be just more focused on important things than um, surviving, right? Or kind of being within these cycles. So um, I, there's a ton more questions in the Q&A. If any of the panelists so choose, they'll be there, you can answer them by typing, um, but uh, in these last five minutes, I just wanna give you all you know, the last word. I do know that we got a question from Claudia of how to find you. I know some of you have already said that. So you know, there will be a recording, there'll be transcripts. So if you don't feel like kind of rehashing some of that, no worries. But um, as, as a Leo in Leo season, I say no shame in plugging. <laughs> this is the time. Um, so please, um, yeah. Close us out, whatever you would like to, to say on scholar activism or anything that you've shared or heard in the panel and uh, where people can find you. I have something to say, it's not about scholar activism. I'm just gonna say all the fellows here, everyone who presented today, they're incredibly talented, they're incredibly intelligent. So please like follow them, give them their flowers. This is like such an amazing group of people and I'm honored to like, have spent these past couple of weeks with them. Ditto.
Yeah, I know for me, I'm just gonna hit a wall of tired. Yeah. My body's like, go be horizontal. <laughs> I think that's where I'm gonna take in the rest of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just so Same. much. <laughs> that's I I fully, fully endorse that. Um happy to attend to the body minds in this space. Um, I saw somebody even figure out how to literally leave flowers in the Q&A chat. So um, yeah, I want to express gratitude to this panel, Z, Natasha, Isabella. Thank you for sharing more wisdom today, for adding to this gorgeous constellation that we're creating. Um, it's been a pleasure sharing space with you this past month with all of the fellows. Um, that's it for me today. I'm going to send us into break and then back at five. Um, Shana will be uh, moderating our final panel um, on building hybrid fellowship communities with even more fabulous fellows. So stay tuned, get horizontal, get a drink, get some snacks, you know, don't tap out yet. We got a little bit more. It's definitely, definitely worth it. So thank you all. So hello, my name is Shana and I am Longmore's Access and Events Coordinator, and I am a South Asian woman in a wheelchair with long black hair, large glasses, wearing a multicolor florally blouse. My background is blurred, and I will be your moderator for our last panel called Building Hybrid Fellowship Communities. So I hope you all are cozy. So this panel is going to be a candid exploration of what it means to build hybrid communities, particularly through the lens of the lessons learned through this fellowship. And joining us on the panel, and if you'd like, um, you can please turn your cameras on, um, our fellows Ebony Oldham, Maya Charnel, and Tai Lu. So first, I'd like to give the fellows a chance to introduce and self-describe themselves. Anyone is welcome to go first. I can go first. Um, hi, my name is Ebony Oldham. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a dark-skinned, Black, non-binary, queer, fat, and disabled femme. Um, I'm wearing some chunky earrings today that are pink gold and silver. Um, I'm also wearing a black top and on top of that black top is a black dress with frillies at the top. I'm wearing two chains, one's gold and one's gold and silver and I'm happy to be here today. Hi, <clears throat> uh, my name is Maya Charnel. Um, I am a brown skin, black, non-binary mask person. Um, I'm wearing a brown hat that says LA on it. Um, I have two braids and a ponytail. Um, I'm wearing pearl earrings. I have a pearl necklace and a um, silver chain necklace on. I also am wearing a um, blue mesh shirt um, that has clouds and uh, white baby angels on it. My pronouns are they, them. <laughs> Hi, my name's Tai Lu. Pronouns are they, them. I am a fair skinned Vietnamese non binary person with long, dark hair um, in a bun on top of my head with a pink scrunchie. I'm in bed against a white wall, and my background is blurred, and I have transparent medical dressings on my face. Happy to be here. Thank you, thank you. So um, before we dive into the questions, um, just a note for our audience, the last 15 to 20 minutes um, are going to be for Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions throughout this panel, uh, you can put them in the Q&A. And then uh, also a note for our fellows, Feel free if at any point I ask a question and you'd like to wrap and you'd like to pass, um, feel free to vocalize that. Now let's dive in. 
So let's start off with a question to help us learn a little bit more about all of you. What communities are you, the fellows, a part of? Or do you call home? And how did you come to them? Or did they find you? Anyone is welcome to go first. Um, Maya here. Um, I believe the communities that I'm mostly a part of are um, disabled communities, Black, non-binary, trans folks, um, photography communities in Los Angeles. Um, I do call Los Angeles home, though I am from Portland, Oregon. A lot of my friends and family are still in Portland, Oregon. So I do find that that is a, a lot of my community. And so a lot of my community is virtual for me. Um, how I came to the community that I do have is mostly through um, my partner, Ebony. Um, a lot of my friends are their friends. Um, I do spend a lot of time in my home um, due to struggling with, um, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome and finding myself, you know, tired a lot of the time. So a lot of my community is virtual. Um, I do find them through, you know, Facebook groups. Um, a lot of sharing my stories online brings me a lot of community. Um, finding them in online spaces is where I do find a lot of my community. Ebony or Ty, would you like to pass? Or would you like to add anything? Okay. Um, so Wait, I'll, I'll jump in. I didn't want, I wanted to see if Ebony wanted to share first. But, um, I'll just say that I find it hard to find connections when I'm mostly nonverbal and also with an intellectual disability. I've always been like ridiculed for the way I speak and and just not comprehending things. Um, and um, yeah, it's just very isolating even like culturally within my family because there's not much language for disability or mental health so I feel like there's no way for me to bring this knowledge back to them because there's no language there um so yeah, if I, um, this abandonment led me to search for support outside of my birth family, especially being queer, trans, two-spirit, made it hard to see, like, myself in, in narratives of storytelling, so I knew I had to pave my own road and in abolition, we're often paving the roads as we walk or roll our mobility aids on them. Um, so during the pandemic, I sh was like sharing hundreds of calls for mutual aid and was fundraising for a friend who couldn't access COVID treatment. And I gathered the people I knew I could trust um, to, and we advocated for her care, and that together we planted the seed for Sick in Quarters, which is now like a growing network of disabled and chronically ill artists and advocates connected to each other and working in collaboration through the internet.
Um, Ebony, they, them. Um, some of the communities um, that I'm a part of, I've been recently doing some organizing work with the Fat Liberation Archive. Um, so definitely see myself as a part of Fat community. Um, um, I think my like, one of my first introductions to community uh, was through Black feminism. And so I think that's like um, a space that remains like my core. My core. Um, and then I was thinking about the last panel. Um, I wanted to like offer like an additional response to some of the um, ways that I've um, tried to build, build community, even if I didn't have it um, uh, in person. Um, uh, in the past, I've like, I collect postcards, black postcards. So that's one way um, that I feel like um, you can share community with others, but also like there's a lineage of like feminist, lesbian, queer, like zine making um, and also um, letter writing. But I've also practiced like sharing a journal with a friend before or sharing it with a few friends and rotating it by mail. Um, like once a month. And so I think that um, has been a way that I found like friendship. Um, but yeah, I think there's many ways I can answer the question, but I'd say like at the core, like um, Black feminism is where I enter community. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think, yeah, all three of these responses really um, go back to the question that was asked earlier, which is how do you build community? Um, when you're in more rural or more virtual um, settings. And so, thank you. So next, I want to delve deeper um, and ask, what are some access issues of any kind that you've encountered while seeking out and or building community? I can go. Um... Some access issues that I think I've encountered when building community, um, yeah, include anti-Blackness and anti-fatness. I mean, I think that uh, for context, I've been an organizer for roughly 15 years and I'm a current PhD student in the Department of Gender Studies at UCLA. And in my experience as an organizer and also a scholar, I think the thing that continues to be a hurdle um, and building community is, um, yeah, the rampant, like rampant culture of anti-fatness and anti-blackness. I think in terms of disability, what comes to mind is um, just the way that like when it comes to blackness or even fatness, like blackness seems to be a thing that confounds people where people don't know how to engage. Um, where care is withheld. And I think the same goes for fatness, but particularly when we're talking about black fatness. And I think that has continued to be a struggle in part because um, there, there does seem to be, um, I think honestly seeing like a lot of uh, repetition of old issues that like black feminists have been talking about for a long time, even Audre Lorde and their work on like the politics of difference. I think people truly don't know how to contend with nuance and contend with difference and flatten and don't bring nuance to anything. <laughs> and I think that people suffer, particularly by people suffer because of that. Um, and I think that there continues to be um, uh, out of fear of like maybe loneliness or isolation, there tends to be a flattening um, and um, rendering everyone the same or as a monolith and I think that's like, can be a trap at times that like, um, doesn't take into to account how people suffer differently. Um, so I think anti-Blackness is one of the things that has been showing up a lot for me most recently in the communities that I've been in, and that's been hard, but also fat community. I mean, that could be quite literally like, do I have a seat in a room that fits my body or just the ways that people pile on to fat people and then that exacerbates um, like quite literally pain. Um, and so I think that's something that I've been sitting with and um, yeah, I guess I'll say that for now. 
Um, I think some of the biggest hurdles for myself are specifically living in Los Angeles is that I don't feel that folks take disabled folks into account. I wholly feel that folks in Los Angeles are not masking a lot of the spaces that we go to. They're very crowded. Um, there is no thought for accessibility, seating. A lot of the times there's, um, everything is normally packed out. Um, there aren't a lot of free things um, that are accessible to disabled folks um, or these spaces aren't having like virtual offerings. And so I find that if I do want to find community or stay in community with folks, I have to leave the house, which is really hard um, for me. And when I do take that charge to leave the house, I feel very scared about being in these spaces where, you know, me and my partner are normally the only two people who are masked. And um, yeah, a lot of those things aren't taken into consideration. And I feel that it is truly a barrier um, for us to stay in community. I mean, even in our friend groups, we're the only disabled people or very few of us, and we're still the only folks masking. And just, you know, thinking about those things, um, trying to be considered in that way, um, not having a lot of disabled friends um, because of that. And so um, that poses a huge challenge um, for us finding space um, within a city that is truly very active um, and very um, in-person oriented. Um, yeah, and I feel that a lot of that work that we make community for one another has to be through each other. Um, and that also poses a lot of um, a barrier because, you know, just having the funds or having the resources makes it really hard. Um, you know, a lot of the offline things have pretty much gone away. Um, and so, I mean, online things have pretty much gone away. And so everything is pretty much offline. And so it makes it really hard. Um, and then, you know, navigating the city is really hard if you don't have a car. Um, things are very spread out. <laughs> you could easily be one city over and it's a two hour, you know, commute. Um, so it's just really hard um, to make and keep community if you're not finding yourself in these very packed, crowded, non-masking spaces um, uh, in Los Angeles. Yeah, I will, this is Ty. I will also second that um, the inaccessibility of living in LA. Um, I've been bed bound for three years and it's just, it's hard to feel heard. Um, it, it just feels like we're living in a vacuum sometimes, um, but um, big obstacles for me include like, um, while, while trying to build community, like a lot of the dis community like the people that we um allow to have these big platforms are white are academics have resources um so big obstacles for me are lateral ableism um like white supremacy and classism, like all of that, even within the realm of disability. And um, as our discussion with Leroy Moore reinforced, disability justice terminology has been co-opted by leftists who are more concerned with theory than praxis. So I think it's important to remain critical of institutions that want to co-opt our experiences. Thank you. I love, um, Ebony, that you brought up a lack of nuances, um, and Ty, that you brought up the importance of remaining critical, right? Um, even for people who claim to be allies. 
Um, and then Maya, for you, the issue like of living in big cities as a person with a disability. I mean, I literally had to move from LA um, because it was because of a lack of access. So um, I strongly relate. Um, and thank you for bringing all of these issues up. Um, so I know we've been like touching upon it, dancing around it. Um, but what have your experiences been like, uh, or sorry, what have, yeah, what have your experiences navigating hybrid spaces um, prior to the fellowship been like? Um, I feel that navigating those spaces when they are available um, has been really nice. Um, what I can truly remember is some of the things that Ebony has put on, like the Black Feminist Summer School. Um, that wasn't exactly a hybrid space, but it had to be fully virtual. Um, and finding those things is very hard but when you do find them um it has been really helpful to have that option of being able to stay in my house um and not forcing myself to go out into these environments that feel wholly unsafe um for us and you know when they are available it's really 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 um helpful to just navigate finding community like ty said it's already extremely isolating to be disabled um because it already feels like it's not enough of us or you're probably the only one in your friend group or the only one in your family that has a language or um maybe is doing this work and so um, when we do find it, I found that I have found a lot of community um, within those spaces and having those options brings in a lot more space for disabled folks to be in these spaces and not, you know, forcing ourselves to get out of bed, um, you know, forcing ourselves to work through pain um, and, you know, helps us like kind of work through some of that internalized ab ableism um, to have more comfort within our community. Um, and so when I have had the experience, it's been beautiful, but it has been very few and far in between. Um, most of my uh, experiences uh, with hybrid have been in an academic context, because that's kind of what I spend most of my time doing as a graduate student. And that has, that looked like um, my first year in this PhD program being all online and or at some point having a hybrid format. So uh, some weeks having class in person and some weeks having class on Zoom. Um, and I think what I've learned from that experience, um, I wouldn't say is, is new because I think um, folks invested in disability justice and disabled folks have been doing this all along. But I think what um, even just being on Zoom a lot um, and like operating within a hybrid space has taught me is what something that like Moya Bailey would call like moving at an ethics of pace. And I like observed and even at times participated in, you know, um, my colleagues wanting to return to what they rendered as normal or like back to normal and like disabled folks or just like the environment around us constantly calling for us to do something different or to slow down. Um, and I think that has really helped me reimagine like what it could look like to organize or pay attention to the moments where that was already present from my past where I didn't even have the analysis or I didn't have the, um, uh, it wasn't present to me, or maybe I didn't notice it. And um, I think, um, yeah, I feel like, um, yeah, it's just brought a lot of clarity to me about how to like do this work and how all of us can enter this work. Even in our, um, in our residency this month, like access check-ins at the top of the meetings, I think have provided so much possibility. And um, I think uh, 
Um, some of the things that I continue to do in terms of hybrid formats, where I think bring that sort of element, uh, is sometimes I co-work with people, whether it's uh, working on creative or artistic projects or doing writing, like if I have to do my homework or even just finding ways to be together, um, whether that's like uh, co-working together or sometimes I have a friend that might be like literally cleaning, but I'm writing like a five page essay or something like, um, I think that has been really beautiful. Um, and also, um, I think one thing that has been cool too is like, being online or virtual like with someone and like going outside together and like quite literally touching grass together or having a picnic or cooking dinner together I think those things um have created community where I felt like I didn't have any or um has problematized what closeness and intimacy could look like for me and I definitely have appreciated appreciated that and like um the unintentional or unintentional, I guess, cross disability solidarity or just cross connections in general that I wouldn't otherwise have if hybrid wasn't a mode that, you know, I cared about or had to participate in, in ways, or many of us had to participate in, or is our only mode of participating. Um, so I think that's what's coming up for me. I will pass. Thank you for sharing. Um, I love what, you know, you both brought up where it's like you're finding community, but then once you find it, you're continually sustaining and creating community. And that also takes a lot of energy and time and labor. So now really taking all of this in, what are some shared lessons learned? from building a hybrid community within Emerge? Um, I take away from this what Leah Lakshmi says about um, disabled folks doing the care and the work for each other and care work. Um, just thinking about how we always are always um, looking out for one another and having those hybrid spaces is just another way that we can do that for one another, um, that we can include each other, that we don't have to um, have folks that are not able to have this community because they're not able to be in person, um, that you have to forego having relationships with folks that are like you, that understand what's going on, that at least you are able to have that sounding board with because you're not able to be there in person. And I really feel that I hope that this um, becomes something that uh, we all can continue to do outside of this space and that we make a norm within society. Um, even after folks feel that the panini is over and it's not, um, that folks can remember that whatever that feels like for them that COVID isn't the only time that folks need to be in virtual or hybrid space. Um, for whatever reason, folks with disabilities who are bed bound or whatever um, uh, keeps folks from being able to be in person needs to be taken into account um, within all of the spaces that we find ourselves in. And I hope that that's something that we can continue moving forward and that we continue to consider um, as we put on events, um, as we um, try to have space with each other to consider that there are folks who will not be able to be in person no matter what the situation is. Can you repeat the question again? Of course, yes. Um, so what are shared lessons learned from building a hybrid community within Emerge? I think some uh, lessons that come to mind is that uh, the way that we enact disability justice um, in and of itself is not a monolith. There's many ways to arrive at the same point. Um, I think something else that comes up for me 
is um oh geez I just lost my lost my train of thought um Hmm. I can't remember. <laughs> but yeah, I think that there's many ways to like arrive at the same the same point. Um uh, uh I think um something else though that does come up come up um for me is that I think doing disability justice work means that you do have to contend with failure, you do have to contend with mistakes. Um, you do have to contend with accountability um, and wrongdoings. And um, I think like having like some sort of politics of reflection uh, is helpful in this work. And that, oh, that's what I was gonna say, is that this work never ends. Like, and I think having some sort of politics or routine of reflection helps sort of build in that, um, uh, build in some like reflexivity or some accountability or community accountability. And I think that, um, yeah, I think the work can like be opened up in a way if we realize that like, we always still have room to grow, like we always still have things to learn. And again, there's many ways to do the same thing. And so once we've like, um, gotten cozy with like one mode or one method, like there's still room to like pivot or to learn something different. Um, and so I think that's what I'm taking away from uh, thinking about hybridity, but also thinking about the eMERGE cohort um, and having a hybrid space. This is Ty. Um, some shared lessons, um, like as T named earlier, access to intimacy is always a learning experience because all of our needs are always transforming like daily, hourly, by the second. Um, and, and also like Z said, this has been one of the most inclusive spaces that I've been in and it still came with its own challenges and conflicting access needs. And a lot of places want to claim to be universally inclusive when that's just not always possible because of the evolving nature of our needs. And some places claim to be hybrid, but when I show up, it feels more like that, that was just performative. And when I'm actually in this space, I don't feel heard as a nonverbal or seen as a bedbound person because it's really like I can, the feeling of disconnect is so visceral. Like I feel like I have no limbs when I'm in bed and I can't like turn the camera to who's speaking or just really things that able-bodied people take for granted. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I really appreciate how a common thread between all of your answers has been that a best practice to inclusion is to continually evolve and shift to meet everyone's needs. Um, so with that, uh, again, kind of uh, going, diving deeper, what ways did engaging in a hybrid space influence your art making and organizing practices? Uh, for me specifically, um, the first thing is that it didn't feel like there was so much pressure to show up in the physical space every day. I am here in person, but there were days where my body just couldn't make it other to the other part of campus, you know, to attend. Um, and so it's just nice not having that pressure to be sitting up or anything like that. And so it gives me, it, I was able to save a lot of energy stressing over that. And so um, just having that experience has helped me um, 
kind of shape the way my work will reach um, folks like me um, moving forward. And, you know, just the meetups and the things that I'm planning to have in Los Angeles, like a queer photo meetup, um, trying to figure out how to have that also hybrid, um, allowing folks to attend photo shoots via my Patreon, um, allowing, you know, things to happen hybrid, um, things that, you know, folks are not considering, um, figuring out how to have more community uh, with folks that I have met here, um, you know, when we get back. And so just considering all of those things, I feel like are shaping the ways that my art will take place outside of this. Um, and I feel that it will help me reach more folks that are like me because I find a lot of the times I reach more photographers than just disabled photographers or reaching disabled folks that are interested in my work um, so that we can have these conversations. And this is first and foremost and not an afterthought. Um, and so thinking about it right off the bat, instead of thinking about it after the fact, after we've had folks in the space, um, I'm also uh, thinking about doing, well, not thinking, working on doing um, a, just a Google Doc of, you know, um, accessible, you know, photo studios or accessible places that folks can meet up for photo shoots um, and just figuring out how we can make those things hybrid. Um, there's ways, you know, and it's something that can't stop just because folks are more in person now. Um, and so that is really shaping the way that events that I hold um, and ways that I get my work to folks will um, look moving forward. You just laid down some best practices. So thank you, Maya. <laughs> um, have any or Ty? I think I could have answered the question earlier, <laughs> but we're all um, tied to yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think just um yeah, just remembering that there's like so many ways to come to this work and um, um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say right now. This is Ty. Uh, how has it influenced my practices? I I'm autistic and I find I learn faster when I'm processing in a group discussion. Like my learning disability makes large blocks of text inaccessible to process. That's really hard for a lot of people to accept. Like just breaking up your text can do so much for me. And if you don't, I can't, I can't absorb what you're telling me. And it's been that way since I was a kid. I just didn't have a way to verbalize it when I was younger. It's, um, I felt shame, like I had to hide that about myself. And I, I do better in environments that understand that my, I learn slowly <laughs> and, and, that's I'm more generative when I am allowed the space to process every word of every sentence in my own time and like while I might not have the cognitive ability to read books like I used to I can still learn like in a in a group in a hybrid group teaches me creative ways to engage with the text like that's not just academic like I can listen to my fellows talking about the text and I can learn so much from their perspectives and yeah it just gives me a sense of context and allows me to build off of um, 
my fellows. Um, yeah, and as far as organizing, I'm just really happy to have connected with everyone here. And I've learned so much already and want to keep learning how I can better support them and myself. Yeah, I think you touched upon um, the huge importance of building these communities is really to give space, to feel peace, to feel invigorated, to feel safe, um, to feel everything. So thank you. Um, and, and with that, you know, with all these reflections, what wins does everyone feel happened in building community together? Um, I believe that I'm walking away with a lot of new friends, a lot of new community, and a lot of resources. Um, just us talking about the things that we've been struggling with and the things that we know, um, the resources that we know, how to um, get certain parts of our projects finished, um, just the ways in which there has been an unlimited amount of sharing between us all has been really helpful. And I just feel a lot less lost um, trying to find these things because sometimes my ADHD does not allow me to know exactly what I'm looking for. And I don't know how to type out a certain thing, but when folks are like, oh yeah, I heard you say you were struggling with this thing. Here's something that I tried. Maybe you should try it. Um, and so it has really been um, amazing, um, just sharing amongst each other um, and just feeling like, you know, we are not going to go back where we were, um, not leaning on each other um, when the time comes or just having each other as community. Thank you. Oh, Ty. I was just going to say that um, just uh, even through like the challenges, I feel like we were able to build some trust together and that means a lot to me. Yeah. Um, I think for me, um, since I came into the cohort, um, uh, as a part of a collaboration on working on a zine, I think that has been something that I have I've taken away from this from this process. How to work together with a friend, how to work together with a partner, um, what it means to do the work of collaboration. Because I I do think like some of this work can't be done in isolation, if not the majority of all of it. And so, just thinking about the gener gener generativeness and like the goodness that comes from collaborating and when two folks work together and what you can't get out of something if you were to just work alone or in isolation has been something that um, has um, been coming up for me. And I think that, I think the same for our group process too, like as a cohort, like the ways that we've put our body minds together to like come up with knowledge, to come up with like new solutions, new ways to like reimagine ourselves in the cohort. I think has been like beautiful, even as it's been challenging. And so I think that's something that I'm also taking away from this is like, you don't have to do everything alone and um, it doesn't make this work less hard, but it doesn't mean that you have to do it by yourself. And so I think that's something that I am um, leaving this fellowship with. And then personally, um, I think I'm also, um, leaving this uh, fellowship like more connected with myself and um, thinking about the ways that I uh, like to produce my art and like, like, do I like to be indoors? Do I like to be outside? Like, um, do I like to be on the phone with a friend? Do I like to be solo? Like, I just think thinking about the ways that I like to create and um, do my work, um, but also thinking about some boundaries I need to set in my life. And um, I also 
uh, most recently got to look at some archives, some, some fat archives here in the Bay, um, some disability archives. And so um, just learning how much people have been like saying the same thing for many, many years and how much folks have been like invisibilized and erased in this work. And so I think I'm also like learning that like um, a lot of the stuff that we're saying and sharing is not new and yet it still needs to be said. And that's unfortunate, but also we have ancestors um, to help us guide this work um, that hopefully we can continue to tap into. That's kind of what's um, on my mind as I'm exiting this program or this part of the program. I love how you brought up the very important question that I think a lot of us forget to ask ourselves, um, which is what do I like, right? Um, and I think so often, especially going through school um, or just being in institutions and working, um, we often don't think about our personal work or school preferences. We just think, oh, sitting up at a square desk in an uncomfortable chair is where we have to be um, when that is not the case. So thank you for sharing all this. Um, okay, so the last question before we turn it over to the Q&A is what challenges arose in this process of community building? Maya, you're muted. I realize I muted. Sorry. <laughs> Finding time and space to have um, camaraderie and community outside of the work that we were doing. Um, because I found that, you know, with a lot of the fighting that we were having to do, you know, to get our needs met or just fighting institutions, we're already always drained. And so that was even more draining. And so it's just really hard uh, to get together and like do things with each other or like any hybrid type of, I don't know, happy hour or hanging out was just really hard. Because as soon as, it, you know, we were done, everybody was just like, all right, woof. okay, <laughs> I need to go do some self-care. I need to go do some aftercare and just kind of try to get to my work. And, you know, that's really hard. I mean, especially when you're getting together specifically to work on your work. Um, finding that time um, to have some camaraderie is just really important. Um, as Imani said, just finding that time for care. And even, you know, folks in the Q&A were just mentioning that that self-care is a privilege. It's really hard to do um, when you're already tired, um, but it's really um, pertinent to keeping yourself like, you know, able to do this work. It really is. You have to reset. You have to empty your cup um, so that you're able to continue on. Um, because like Ebony said, this is ongoing work. This work is forever, you know? And so it was just really hard for us to find that space and time to kind of hang out with each other as a group, you know, of like 11 people. Um, but, you know, we we had chats, you know, and we were able to get, you know, together on Discord and Signal and check in with one another and at least support one another in that way. But yeah, it's really difficult to find time um, to just hang out. Um, yeah, totally echo echoing what you've offered, Maya. Um, I think the challenge that I'm, I'm sitting with that came up um, in our experience is just so much of what you already named. And I think um, Armani named this earlier, um, but this work um, doesn't be, this work shouldn't be um, at our expense and doesn't become doesn't shouldn't come before us but like if that's not realized or centered like um it can happen at the expense of us and that like our relationship to the work matters just as much as the actual product of the work um and then another thing I think that comes to mind is like asking for you what you what you need but also what you want and seeing what happens um Another thing that comes to mind is being curious about people, even, even those folks and communities that feel familiar with us kind of 
bringing in a sense of curiosity, I think, helps make less assumptions and um, open opens up space for us to know the same thing differently. And um, I also think too that this work is messy <laughs> and it's hard. And like, if I could just be frank, there's gonna be people that piss you off, people that you don't like, people that you don't get along with, like people that you have to like set boundaries with. I mean, like obviously we have to set boundaries with ourselves and everybody, but like all the things and um, just because it's like an organizing or disability justice space doesn't mean that like it is a space of purity. It is a space that it's a space that's untouched by anti-blackness or fat phobia or anti or anti-fatness or racial capitalism or whatever the case may be. It's just as touched by it and perhaps needs to be engaged intimately and closely in order to recognize it, because I think those spaces can be um, glorified because of a scarcity politic like oh we don't have these spaces like and I just think that perhaps like not we we need to like use a, a more critical eye in these spaces not because these spaces are doing more like injustice or more harm or more oppression than others but because I think um yeah like a scarcity model can allow us to accept just whatever and I think that like disabled people deserve like not just scraps and whatever they deserve the world they is we deserve to like push our people further um in ways that make sense in order to get to liberation otherwise we're just about to be <laughs> recreating the same thing we're trying to get away from and I think that has become clear to me um in this program and like um has like I guess like reified why I'm committed to this work This is Ty, I'm gonna pass because I feel like Maya and Ebony named, answered that one so thoroughly. Just thank you. I wanna, you know, thank you for being vulnerable and for being um, very open and honest. Um, and I know it takes a lot of energy, so I appreciate it. And now we'll go to the Q&A portion. Um, I see one question. Uh, and you already touched on this, um, but if anything else comes to mind, please feel free to weigh in. Um, what have you learned about actively including folks who join hybrid events remotely rather than treating them as afterthoughts, especially when it comes to less formal social time, like meal times, breaks between events, et cetera? I think for me, it is like completely <laughs> like helped me like reimagine like all the things like time and space all together. Cause like the way that like white supremacy wants you to like see everything as like linear or teleological, meaning like beginning, middle, end, or like progressive is like obviously like disabled folks, queer folks, black folks disrupt that all the time anyway. But I think this cohort has really been like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. And so I think for me, yeah, I think like uh, bringing up Moya Bailey again, like an ethics of pace, like things take much more time. And like when we also rush things, like I think we're more likely to make mistakes and not like prolonging things to the point where we're afraid of making mistakes because that's also a part of this work, but also realizing, giving ourselves the dignity and grace of like the carefulness of time and what that can offer and how people can feel when we really take our time with this work, I think is something that I am um, uh, like sitting with from this process and constantly trying to like implement into my own work and knowing that this work isn't going anywhere. Um, and if someone else gets to it, gets to it before us, like that's okay too. Like there's always room, like there's always work to be done. Um, and there's always work that we can do differently that might be coming from the same root. And yeah, I mean, I think I could get into more like specific things and technical things too, but I think that's kind of like my overall um, gem that I'm taking away is like, it's okay to take time. Also, it's okay to request feedback from people, run things by people, like the folks that you imagine to be in the space, like pay them to like, 
look over something or like ask a friend like hey like I'm putting this together or I'm doing this thing like what do you think about this or just like building in extra time and spaciousness because like again I think like being disabled and chronically ill disrupts time inherently in and of itself and so like knowing that allows you to orient differently and so I think that being a part of not only like the actual event or the content of the event but being a part of the like event making process and or like pre-process to anything that you're doing I think is important um and then I guess I the last thing I would say is like not always being tied or married to like an end point or like how you think something is going to like come out and realizing that like I think one of the beautiful things about being disabled is like it remixes the end or you don't really know if there is an end or you don't know what the end is going to always look like and so it might not be finite and being okay with that like the queerness of disability or like the queerness of time or all those things I think that's something that I have to really work on as like someone who's like um working through the ways that white supremacy has taught me perfectionism as like being like oh yeah the way that like we saw this could change it could be different and like perhaps that's even more beautiful perhaps that's even more generative perhaps that like offers something else and like leads to all these other possibilities so I think that's also something I'm sitting with Just to interject, uh, Ebony, I believe you said, my, my Zoom cut out for a second, but I be believe you said living with a disability remixes the end. Um, and I just love that phrase and I'm going to burn it in my memory. Okay. Are we good to move to closing statements? Hi, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. <laughs> you caught me. Um, I just wanted to add that, like, just echoing Ebony, like, being more thoughtful about every stage of the process and being, like, open to how it ends up. Um, I think we all, like, many of us have to do that being disabled because we don't know how our next day is going to look so we have to be ready to adapt to whatever comes at us and i've found from my experience facilitating that like just giving um being more mindful of of hybrid needs can go a long way like just people feel so seen and that's that's what's important to me yeah thank you for bringing it back to inclusion um okay can i add one more thing yeah sorry i think also one thing that um that comes up for me, like, uh, when there's not enough spaciousness and time for, like, uh, taking into account folks who might, might be, uh, joining a space from, like, online is, like, the unintentional and intentional ways we, like, engage in punitive behavior, um, because people are not, quote, unquote, in real life or in person, and, like, I don't really have much more to say in that I think that could just be food for thought for all of us as someone who like deeply believes in the work of abolition. It's like, I do think there are unintentional ways we punish people for not showing up in ways that we deem as appropriate. And I don't even mean in like super explicit, like ableist ways, but like, yes, that too. But I just think like, what ways even in our imagining of things are we always already punishing people because we don't imagine them as the center or the core to begin with and like see them as like, afterthoughts I think that is not just like symptomatic of ableism I also think that is symptomatic of like punishment and criminality and like other things so it's just something that I'm thinking I want to share that comment totally portaled me um as T said earlier that was wow that was really powerful 
Um, thank you. Um, okay, so with that, I would like to um, give you all time for any closing remarks that you may have. Um, you can use this time for anything. We can, like, I would encourage you to plug yourselves, um, tell us what we can anticipate in the future and celebrate. This time is yours. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to put my website in the chat. It's uh, mayacharnell.com. And um, folks can also follow me on Instagram at mayacharnell. Um, I'm going to put that in the chat as well. Uh, coming soon will be my Patreon, um, where I will be... Um, teaching photography classes and just doing um, some classes about navigating disability or just talking about my life navigating disability. Um, so that will be happening. We'll be hosting more virtual and hybrid events um, for disabled folks to attend. Um, <laughs> thanks, Deb. Uh, yeah, um, also, Eb and I will be at some point um, releasing our zine, um, Notes on Fleshiness. Um, and so can't wait for y'all to see that. Um, I don't know what website that'll be on, but we'll definitely post it on Instagram when it's up. Um, yes, yeah, so please follow Engage. I would love to have more disabled folks in my space. I always feel like it's kind of weird um, talking to able-bodied people about what I'm going through. <laughs> because um, they just kind of pity me or make me feel weird. Um, so yes, I would love to continue these conversations with you all. Um, yeah, and by my art. Yeah, it's it's coming. Ebony, would you at all? That was a sweet note in the chat. Thank oh, you. yeah. <laughs> I don't have a website. I'm working on it, but I'm also okay with that. Cause like, also like, I don't have to professionalize my skill set. Go follow me on Instagram. Cause I'll be turning these looks and that's where you can find me. Um, also you can find me on Twitter. Um, and if you're like interested in me as a person, you can also follow me on Patre Patreon. I posted um, my Patreon up thread, but when I start talking, I can post it again. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, go follow Ty and Maya. Thanks. Um, I just want to interject uh, uh, with Ebony's comments. It said, everybody go buy Maya's art soon. Request a photo shoot if you're in the area and follow them on Patreon in the coming weeks. Okay, bye, LOL. And then the next note, um, everybody, please go follow Ty and donate to them ASAP. Ask them about the orgs they're a part of, OMG. Have you followed them on Twitter and IG? Fund their doc. Okay, bye. Love this. Love this community. Um, Ty, would you like to close us out? I'm just grateful to be part of this conversation and making new friends. Yeah. Amazing. So we will share out um, all of this information that was posted in the chat with um, people's IGs and Patreons and um, so forth. Um, and so now I just really want to thank everyone so much for joining us. Thank you to our interp in interpreters and captioners. Thank you to Imani who opened for us. And of course, the biggest thanks goes to you fellows. Um, again, just really appreciate this very candid conversation. Um, and I look forward to celebrating your work. This concludes the Emerge Symposium. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.